Welcome to Uptown Rumble, Heavy Music in the Bronx. My name is Stephen Payne, Director of the Bronx County Historical Society. Today is December 26th, 2023. Lenny, why don't you go ahead and introduce yourself for a little bit. Sure. Uh, Lenny Bednars, originally from uh, Yorkville, a little neighborhood in uh, Manhattan. I play guitar and sing vocals, and I've played in bands like Without a Cause, uh, Fahrenheit 451, District 9, Dominican Day Parade, Crazy Eddie, and I mean a slew of others. I've been a part of so many different little projects, one-offs and everything else, but those five main bands is what I've mostly, you know, sort of, I guess, been known for. Badass. Well, really appreciate you being here today with us. Uh, and before we get into music and uh, hardcore and, and everything, um, why don't you start off by telling us a little bit about your family's history and background and whatever you about, might know about how they ended up in uh, New York in general, how you ended up at the projects you grew up in, all of that. Sure. Um, my mom's originally from Long Island City, Queens. Uh, her dad was taxi cab driver, longshoresman. My father actually grew up in Yorkville. Um, he originally grew up in the neighborhood lived a bunch of old places, kept coming back to Yorkville just because that's where his uh, mom, you know, lived more or less her whole life. Mm -hmm. And originally we, from when we were, when I was born, I believe we lived in a tenement on 94th Street and 2nd Avenue. And we were there until about 1978. And my sister was born in 77, so we had to get out of there and make more room. And at the time, the projects was probably, you know, it wasn't, they aren't, they didn't really like they are now. The projects we moved into, Stanley Isaacs Holmes Towers, they were fairly new by, you know, by project standards. They were built in the uh, mid-60s. Yeah, yeah. So they were still fairly new projects. I mean, by the time we moved in, they were only maybe like less than 15 years old. Wow. So everything was still new. Um, and... I lived there up until 2008, I moved out of there, yeah. but we essentially, going to the projects was sort of like a step up from the tenement we lived in. The tenement we lived in, even though I've looked up where the apartment that I grew up in, I looked up and the rent there now is, I think it's like $4,200 a month. Damn. And I, and I know the, um, when we moved into the project, I think our, our initial rent, I think was... 250 a month and by the time I left it was six and change yeah yeah and by the time my mother and sister moved out a couple of years ago it was almost two grand they were just push you know they're just trying to empty out the projects essentially yeah. you and know how and many bedrooms was it was a three bedroom three bedroom with a river river view right on the East River um, but the projects I knew and grew up in it was you know Mixed cast of characters, you know, a lot of, a lot of poor whites. Um, everyone knew each other. Everyone's parents knew everyone else's parents, and we had people of all colors and persuasions. Um, but by the time the mid '90s rolled around, you know, the powers that be felt that it was a little, it wasn't diverse enough. So they started, they started just bringing people in and. It actually turned into like, like a fairly decent place to live. To, you're probably gonna get jumped by who knows who, you know. Yeah. And I mean, it wasn't a common. I remember I used to have never have a problem walking into the building, and on several occasions I had cops come up to me and was like, "Why are you here?" And I'm like, "I live here." And at the time, you know, I didn't really carry ID until my twenties, and cop, I was like, I could prove that I live here, you know, and knock on the door, and my mom would answer, and they'd be like, does he live here? like, yeah. Slam the door in the cop's face, you know, yeah. they couldn't believe, I guess cops couldn't believe that white people actually can be poor and live in the projects. I mean, not that we were poor working class. My father worked for the MTA for 20 some odd years. My mother did books and everything for a paper delivery service. So we weren't poor, but we weren't, you know, we were working class, I guess you could say. Really weren't middle class, but, you know, we never went hungry. We never went without stuff. Um, I mean, my father, up until, 
12 years, my father passed away in 2006, and sometime in the 90s, he decided to clean, you know, he was, he had a problem with uh, alcohol and substances, and yeah. he got his shit together, and, you know, moved, you know, went to meetings, in fact, that's, became his life, going to AA, <laughs> wow. but he, he loved it, um, he liked being a part of that community, but, like I said, where we grew up, it was community, essentially, you know, everyone knew everyone else, we all got into trouble together, and, you know, growing up, I was more or less raised on my parents' music, um, you know, there was a station up here, CBS FM, the oldies station, I mean, now, I've turned it on a couple times, and now the oldies is like Pearl Jam and Nirvana, and I'm like, like, I was like, I remember when they shit was new, you know, I'm like, oh my god, I'm getting old, it's terrifying, you know, it, it really is, and, um, you know, when I was growing up, it was like Dion and the Belmonts, uh -huh. uh, Frankie Valli and the Four Seasons, Frankie Lyman, you know, it was all this more like 50s doo-wop stuff, you know, and maybe early 60s stuff, and, and yeah. the, the Stones, and the Beatles, and, you know, things like that, and I guess the Beatles was probably my first, like, real, like, band I sussed out, you know, oh, I love okay, that. okay, okay. Um, and what about schools? Did you go to schools in the neighborhood? Yeah, yeah, we went from kindergarten to eighth grade, I went to Catholic high school, not Catholic, Catholic, Catholic elementary school. Here, look. From kindergarten to eighth grade, I went to a Catholic elementary school, St. Stephen's of Hungary. Um, 82nd First Avenue. Um, kind of interesting to be in a, the same school for like nine years of your life. Um, out of the 20 some odd kids I graduated with, I think it was like five of us who made it from kindergarten all the way to eighth grade together because wow. you know some kids came and went yeah sure you know so i think there was like five of us that actually did the whole term in one school um that's when i started going to school there that was 19 i want to say 1978 or 79 and the nuns still hit you uh-huh the nuns still beat the living shit out of you mm -hmm. you know that they stopped that around 1980 81 where the nuns stopped t putting their hands on kids because um some, you know, back in the day, you got hit, especially other parents would hit you if you got out of line. Yeah. And it usually was like, oh, Mr. Smith hit me. It was like, well, what did you do to deserve it? You yeah. know, it was like that was usually the case. Yeah. Um, but went there, and then from there, I wasn't very, not that I wasn't a very good student, but um, after I went to a place called Cathedral Prep Seminary, it's located around here, I think. I'm not really sure, but it was a... I've seen it before. I yeah, it, it's it essentially a seminary school. The only reason why we went, th I went there was because the tuition at the time was super cheap. Oh, okay. It was like $600 a year. Yeah. And back then, your average price for a high school for like for the whole like school year was like $1,600 a year. Wow. I mean, now I know it's way... So much. Yeah. Way more than that, but it, it, was, it was like $600 a year. I had no intentions of becoming a priest. I was like, Fucking cheap tuition, sure. Uh -huh. I'll take advantages. I think they sort of sussed me out from jump because they knew that I wasn't going to be a priest. They kind of saw it in the gleam in my eye, like, <laughs> like, you know, he's a tr he's got trouble. And uh, that, and I flunked one subject. No, I actually flunked two. I flunked Latin and math. And they just, you know, they were like, oh, well, you have to go to summer school, but you can't come back. And I was like, all right, fine, fuck it. Yeah. You know, it was like, Wound up at another school that, like, kind of like a private school for, like, a year, which was a place called Quintano's. It's gone. Um, and then that place actually shut down before we could go back the following year. So I wound up at this place called High School for the Humanities on 18th Street and 8th Avenue, between 8th and 9th. It's still called Humanities, but I think it's, like... I think it was actually, a, the official name was the Byron Rustin School for the oh, Humanities. Yeah, 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 okay. And did a year in there, and honestly, because of the credits that the one private school went to didn't count, they were like, well, you have to do another year. I wound up dropping out in 91, and I just had had enough because I was cutting school a lot. I was getting, into, not get, really getting into, well, I was getting into trouble, but at school... I, at the time, we had truant officers, and they would chase you down, and you had two choices. They would either take you to their 
they had like a little holding pen area off of Times Square. You never go to Times Square when you're cutting school back then. <laughs> so, and my father was working nights, so he's home. So I couldn't go home. Shit. So I was like, well, what do you do? So I wound up going to a lot of museums. Mm. Um, I actually went going to a ton of museums all throughout the city, Queens, Brooklyn, you know, and just kept my time occupied looking at things, going to the public library, reading books, just sort of, I guess, educating myself because at the time, which is why I was cutting schools, high school was boring to me. And what the teachers were teaching you at that time, it just was like, you could tell they were reading from a planner, they didn't give a shit. A lot of them had already done their 10 years, they were at the end, they had already done their time in the 60s and the 70s and the 80s, they were sort of done. You know, they were at the, you know, we're talking about teachers that were well into their 60s. Yeah. You know, so they were like, all right, we're going to, it's like, okay, this is just bullshit. So I just wound up cutting school. I mean, later on, I did get my GED, um, you know, and I make a pretty good living at what I'm doing. So I don't really think, you know, high school wasn't for me, but that's me. Yeah, I can't, I can't talk about other people's uh, experience with high school. And yeah, that was it, just school and, you know, never thought I was going to, you know, I knew, like, first year of high school, I was not going to college. Yeah, yeah. You know, that that was just off the books for me. It was, you know, my father was always pushing me when I got a little older, he was like, got to get a union job, got to get a union job. I eventually got a union job. Yeah, sure, sure. You know, it was like, you know, I applied for every city municipal test that there was, civil test that there was, every MTA test, every sanitation and then, you know, the iron workers thing sort of, like, popped up, like, out of left field. And yeah. I was like, fuck it, I'll take it. You yeah, know, and sure. you know, I've been doing that for 16, 17 years now. You know, done everything from City Field, the Yankee Stadium, World Trade Center, Lincoln Center, uh, and tons of things in between. Uh, I mean, it's funny, I probably have forgotten more about the building I've worked on. Like, we'll pass something, go, like, oh, shit, I... I worked on that or shit. I, I'm one of these iron workers who don't say I built that. No, I worked on it because yeah, there's sure. some guys that are like, "Oh, I built that." It's like all by yourself. <laughs> That's amazing, you know. Worker. Yeah, I, just see, I gotta be a constant ball buster with that stuff. Yeah, you yeah, know, yeah, I, under, sure. I understand the pride in your work, but yeah, yeah, you know, yeah. relax a little bit, guys. Right, what and what local? Are you local five eighty. Local five eighty. Yep, local yeah, five eighty. Yeah. Proud member. Um, but yeah, it's been, you know, it's funny because in my line of work, there's so many different, like, um, I've run into a lot of hardcore people, you know, people, funny enough, there's some guys I've run into who saw some of my old bands, like, back in the day, huh. and they go, I saw, you know, and, and there's a couple of hardcore dudes, actually, who work in the local, like, from bands, like, Freddie from 25 to Life. Wow. is an iron worker. Tommy Carroll from Straight Ahead is an iron worker. And then there's a lot of other dudes who just, you know, they've had bands here and there and they've been iron workers and whatnot. And, you know, it's just, you know, really interesting, like, how hardcore sort of has spread even into my workplace area. Although I don't go talking about me being in a band when I'm at work, usually. Yeah, sure. It's just like I kind of do what I got to do and get the fuck off. You know, it's, you know... That's a job. Yeah. I, ha I, you know, what I do for music is really nobody's concern. Yeah, you know, I do sure. it for me. I don't do it for other people. For sure. But yeah, it's interesting because New York hardcore really is working class, and punk in general always claims it. But you know, in certain scenes, the working class connection just isn't. Yeah, to there. a certain degree. Yeah, I yeah. mean, usually it's an. Ex usually, I find that a lot, a lot of people, it's usually an escape from their like, you know from their lives. Like when I got back in it, it was like the kids I met and you'd go over their house and like their home line, their home lives weren't terrible, but yeah. you could also tell they weren't specifically great, but let's get real. When you're a teenager, whose, whose life is really that ideal? Yeah. You know, right. you know, we all think that the world is, is so fucking terrible when we're a teenager and it's like, oh, wait till you get into your twenties, thirties, forties, into your fifties guy. <laughs> You know, and you got to start paying bills and doing shit. You know, yeah. it's like you, this is nothing. This is just the this is just a precursor for how fucking shitty it's gonna get. You know, that's right. That's right. Um, so, 
growing up, uh, did you mostly hang out with like kids from your building? Like, what was your friend group like? Uh, I when I was younger, I had a couple of same old, same old friends. You know, f- parents were friends with each other. So there was a couple of people that I hung out with, which I unfortunately am no longer friends with for various reasons. Sure, sure. Um, as a teenager, I wound up hanging out with a couple of the older kids. And as I got into my later teens, I realized I had to get the fuck out of there. I had to do something else. Only because we were getting into, this is like, you know, mid to late 80s. And we had the crack epidemic happening. And, you know, we were all little hooligans. Yeah. yeah. You know, stealing people's cars, you know, arson. Fucking robbery, general mischief. God forbid it was around the 4th of July. Everyone had fucking fireworks. You know, Halloween. Oh, my God. Halloween was the worst. <laughs> you know, forget about the eggs. Be, you know, I remember we used to go traveling and cruise the kids, like up to 30, 40 kids. Eggs was the least of their problem. We'd have slingshots. We'd have BB guns. We'd have paint guns. You know. A couple of people had clubs, maybe a bat or two, and just caused general mischief throughout the neighborhood, you know, and we are those kids. And, you know, some of those kids wound up being productive members of society. Actually, a bunch of them did. But, you know, some of them fell by the wayside. Some became junkies. Some still are junkies. Yeah, um, yeah. And I just realized that, like, I got to, you know, I sort of fell into one of the neighborhood guys, me and him, sort of started a band, you know, and I guess it all started off, this guy I grew up with, Ray, we would be up in his apartment, we have a friend from Inwood that they knew coming down, and we make up goofy songs on a broken acoustic guitar, and I think it was like December of 1990, we all kind of like, we all invited a ton of friends down to a place called Giant Rehearsal Studios down on 14th Street, and we just kind of made noise, and out of that, sort of grew, you know, well, it started technically as misguided youth. We only played one show, but then made some changes, got a different drummer. And then in 91 is where that really, that that's where like my musical journey really started. I mean, it started earlier than that, but it really like once, we, once we got like, and it was all for the most part, except for one dude, it was all like, Yorkville guys. Yeah. The drummer was from Yorkville. The guitar, both guitar players from Yorkville. The singer from Yorkville. The bass player was from Inwood, and um, and that went on till like December, I'd say, of like ninety one, and then that's more or less kind of where I started to get introduced to guys from the Bronx. You want to segue from there? Um, yeah, yeah. We we will in a second. Before we do that, though, let's let's uh, yeah. get into. Uh, uh, how you first were introduced to hardcore, because uh, I, I was like five or six years before that, right? Oh, well, hardcore... Not New York hardcore, but... Hardcore in general, but yeah. hardcore for me, like, again, I was always like, I listened to, like, my parents' music growing up, and I had, a, I had a, like, an undying love for Beatles. Like, I think Beatles is always like this easy music to listen to it's going to be you know in a hundred years from now is that going to be the new classical music you know and it sort of has become that in a way you know yeah. they have transcribed a lot of beetle pieces to orchestral pieces That's and right. it's pretty wild that you know for you know working class kids from liverpool you know has had an effect on generations and still do yeah sure um i want to say my journey really began around 1995 uh oh 1985, and the first time, what it was, was when we used to have, uh, you know, you could rent videos, video rental joints, My friend's mother would always, she'd get a video, and then she'd allow me and her son to get our own video, yeah. you know, like, a, it would be like a Friday night thing, you know, like, oh, they could watch their video, and then we'll watch, you know, the adults will watch their film, and... I just remember we were going through the aisle, and this wasn't like a blockbuster. This was like one of those mom and pop video stores. Sure. And it had the decline of Western civilization. 
and we're looking at it like, oh shit, you know, like like what's this cover about? You know, they they didn't really have covers. That I don't. I think it was the Darby Crash cover, with him sprawled out and yep. turn it around. And I think there's a slight description about punk rock or something on it. I don't yeah, really remember. There's the, like a few random things on the. Yeah, I think there were like, might have been some stills. What there is, yeah, stills. And um, so we got that, watched it, and I, like the first time I saw, it, I was like, you know, the opening. I mean. Although the opening uh, track on that is actually Nausea by X, it's the the pit that they showed going on was actually during the Circle Jerks. So it's you know, it's people just fighting to survive in a pit, and you're like, what is this? It's yeah. like a it's like a riot going on. Like it, it amazed me, you know. Then we watched it, and I just got kind of sunk into it a little bit. My, I think I spoke to my older sister's boyfriend Phil about it and he had been into some earlier hardcore and punk stuff and and he already had made the transition over to like you know liking metal and and shit like that by that point and for Christmas that year he got me two tapes and one was group sex by circle jerks and damage by black flag now I sort of gravitated more to the black flag thing. Yeah, yeah. You know, and I, in my young mind couldn't process that the vo- the voice I was hearing on Damage was not the voice that I was seeing on Decline because that sure. was uh, Ron Reyes. Yeah. You know, and they had already made that switch to Henry by that point. But I gravitated to that and there was just something about that, you know, hearing that first Greg Ginn, like him turning the guitar on and that quick, like, what the fuck is that noise? Yeah. You know, and at this point, I've been listening to nice, like, nice things again, like the Beatles and, and, and radio songs. So this sort of blew my fucking mind. And I always had these two tapes. And then I, slowly and surely, like, I want to say 86 of the following year, I had a friend of mine that I went to elementary school with. And he, I don't remember which Slayer record was. It wasn't Rain and Blood yet. That didn't come out quite yet. Oh, um. Haunting the Chapel? Or Show No Mercy? Oh, okay, one of those. Two. One of those two, but yeah, it was yeah. the one. I think it might have been the EP that Chemical Warfare was on. Okay. Anyway, he had a dub of it, and he played it, and it was like, "Wow, this is fucking nuts," you know. I was like, and I, you know, I didn't see the cover art at that point. I just yeah. heard this like crazy demonic shit. And, you know, little did I know, looking at artwork later, it'd be like, "This is some demonic shit," <laughs> <laughs> you know. Um, it, it was pretty wild. I mean, we we were just like, and at that time. MTV used to give, like, the heavy metal half hour in the afternoon right after school. Yeah. So we'd run over to his house. Like, he lived a couple blocks away from the school, the elementary school. And we'd watch it. And they would play they'd play some bullshit, but they would play some decent stuff, too. Yeah, yeah, And we would just be like, oh, shit. And that's, like, the introduction at that time, I think, was, like, Kerry King walking by and smacking the gong with his BC Rich. Um, it was and then, you know, eventually that changed to Headbangers Ball, and, and you had to wait till midnight to 2 to watch, you know, and usually the last 15 minutes is where they played all, like, the shit you really wanted to see. Of course. Before yeah. that, it was, like, hair metal, and, and, uh-huh. and, and, and you know, some of that stuff ha- had its merit, you know. Yeah, for sure. not, a, not all of it, but some of it had its merit. But I guess after the Slayer thing, he gave me, a, once uh, Rain and Blood came, he gave me a dub of that. So, you know, and, and again... I don't really know anybody who was into hardcore first. Yeah. Everybody was a metalhead. You know, everyone everyone came from somewhere, and usually metal was their gateway drug. Very rarely does someone go, I I started out with punk rock, and, you know, and I mean, technically I did sort of start out with punk rock, yeah. but it was like, it was like this weird shit, because even if I gave it to my friends, that you know, we'd hang out downstairs, put it in the boombox, what is this fucking shit, you know, yeah, and sure. it was like... And a couple of years later, they, everyone started getting things like Leeway sort of came on our radar, you know. Uh, Leeway was, you know, had that crossover sound. And then, you know, then it, then you read it, you know, thank you lists, and then you're picking up. That, that's how we found out about bands is reading other bands' thank you lists. It's like, oh, I've heard of this band before. And you know, then next thing you know, you listen to the live Agnostic Front Seabees record. And then you listen to Killing Time, and a sick ball comes across your table. And then... The next thing you know, you're just listening to all this crazy shit, and you know, and at that time too, listening to shit like Mucky Pop from New Jersey. Sure, sure, sure. Um, so for some reason, 
I don't know how the fuck I found about out about this, but you know, MDC. Oh wow, yeah, yeah, yeah. I don't yeah, know yeah. how that came across. I think it was like I think John Wayne was a Nazi, you know, the song yeah. I, I, someone played it for me. I was like, "That song's hysterical." Yeah, yeah. And yeah, then yeah. I listened to the rest of it, and I was like, "All right, this is he's, it's, you know, Dave definitely has something to say, yeah, you know." That's right, that's right. And and I've seen interviews with Dave from MDC before, and he's got something to say. Sometimes he doesn't shut up. Um, <laughs> but he, you know, I, I get where he's coming from. Yeah, sure. You sure. know, and then you find out about like DRI, you know, yeah. and you know, hometown boys for you guys, and um, and I think the first like video I owned was probably that DRI Live at the Ritz uh, back in they were the crossover tour in 86 or 87, 87, you know, where uh, Gavin from Burn is doing security beats up one of the guys for trying to push him off the stage. <laughs> Gavin's going to love that. He won't talk to me about it. He's like, yeah, I know you know all about it. Uh, <laughs> sorry, Gavin. But yeah, you know, we just, I guess it just starts spiraling like, you find out about other things, right. and then friends would sort of bring shit in, and someone else would bring something to the table, and you know, and then you then all of a sudden you're finding out bands like Gorilla Biscuits, and but it was really weird because to me, like Jersey bands and and New York bands and like the local thing definitely got a lot of love, but when it came to California, the closest thing we probably were listening to, besides you know obviously the metal stuff was like maybe suicidal oh okay okay you know yeah, suicidal sure. was on our map i don't think seven seconds was on anyone's map yet um uh, definitely uniform choice definitely was not yeah. um and, you know this is stuff we found out later by you know listening to stuff like you today and and gb uh, you know you start finding out about the more posy stuff and the more straight edge stuff and yeah. then it just sort of grew from from that you know aspect it was fun though, you know. I mean, it was fun for, like discovering new bands. Like, like it was almost like, like, wow, like, like you, you almost felt like, like you discovered gold. You know, it was like, what is this new sound? What is this thing? And you know, I had, I had just loved it. You know, it was like, and I, I by I would say by like ninety ninety one, I was like done with fucking metal. Yeah. You know, I was totally, I was totally into it like you know neck deep and i i couldn't escape it i mean you know by that point I, yeah i stopped buying metal records at that point it's I kind see, of funny yeah. i've i've gone back and bought those all those old metal records on vinyl now because you know i those guys who collect vinyl tell you it's that it's if you get the itch it's just like like oh, i get it i don't understand why and it just i guess it's a childhood thing yeah, yeah, yeah. because you know a lot of times you would very rarely you get records, you get t cassettes. Of course, yeah. But when you get the LP and, you know, the whole the whole fucking thing of taking it out of the sleeve, looking at the lyric sheet, and uh -huh. being able to actually read the lyric sheet, and not having to take out a magnifying <laughs> glass and going, you know, because some of those... It's depending on the quality sometimes. Yeah, sometimes they're on the quality, really things are just it. smudged right yep. the fuck out. Yep. And you're just like, you know, like, he was saying that? <laughs> really? I, I would have never known. But yeah, it was... You know, like I said, by 91, it was like metal was just, you know, it was done for me. I, yeah. I you know, I, I never really st stopped giving a fuck about it, but to a certain degree, I guess a lot of guys, it was almost sort of normal for some people to sort of shed that that metal armor, so to speak, and yep. like jump into hardcore and like, you know, fuck them long hair guys. Yep. You know, and, and then you, everyone, sh you know, starts shaving their head and... And, you know, get, getting weird fucking color, you know, when you get, get a crew cut out, be, bleach a blonde, you know, all this other shit that came with it, you know, and, and going to hardcore shows, you know, with long hair could be problematic depending on the show you're at. Yeah, sure. But it was more of like a Brooklyn, Manhattan thing, the problem, you know, problem of having long hair, you know, like bands would play, you know, hardcore metal bands would play with each other, but... There was always a segment of people who were looking for trouble. Yeah, of course. And if, tr if trouble popped up, they found it, you know. There was a lot of, like, dangerous shit that went on at shows back then. And, you know, we'll get into that in a little bit. But, yeah, like I said, that was my introduction, though. Just, you know, the Black Flag tape was, like, the thing. And I've owned it. I've owned two different copies of it. I've owned the CD. And now a friend of mine actually sent me, you know, it on vinyl. Because it's... They, 
SST Records is so sporadic when they yep. repress stuff. They their website looks like it was created with GeoCities. <laughs> yeah, it, it, it's Greg, Greg Ginn, you got to get your shit together, bro. I know, I know you don't pay bands and shit, but like seriously, you got to get your shit together. It's like, you know, if if Discord can have a fairly decent looking stripped down website, you can too, and it's functional. You yeah. know, it's like I look at that and it's like. It looks like a government listing, you like, you know, like the .dot org websites. You know where you go, ah, oh, I got that. what? <laughs> you know, back in the day when people had to print off websites because you couldn't stand looking at them. On oh the no, yeah, no, I know. It's like, and what would we do today without uh without our phones? It's yeah, nuts. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, so did you yourself go through the kind of you know? I, sometimes people is literally like an overnight transformation where you had long hair. You just woke up one day, shaved it, threw on a hardcore shirt. Did you, or was it more gradual for you? Uh, I think, I think with hardcore shirts, I don't think I ever really owned any real hardcore shirts. Probably till the mid '90s, honestly, yeah, with you. Yeah, yeah, sure. I think I had metal shirts from like '86, '87 till about 1990. And I, I mean, I, I grew my hair as best I could. It never grew right. It was more like bad mullet, <laughs> you know, it was real poofy on the top and just fucking, you know, it just the top just couldn't grow, yeah. you know. It was like, I don't know. It just, I guess one day I went to school and I fell in with uh, kids who went to metal and hardcore because those, those those crowds in school there wasn't enough of us to have two separate groups. Yeah, sure, sure. So anyone who listened to, like, metal and hardcore all sort of hung out in the same group, and I don't remember what made me shave my head, but that's what I did. I actually shaved my head. I was yeah. just like, I was like, fuck this, you know? Yeah. And, you know, for, like, years, like, there were, like, two, three years, I really tried to get, like, my hair to grow like like, like Cliff Burton, you know, just yeah, like sure. that, like, real thick, long hair, and it just, it grew, like, an afro essentially and it just it was just terrible so i think it was p partly conch like conscious of just like like yeah fuck this um and at that time too i know like like friends of mine started going to hardcore shows and they'd always come back like with these stories of like how violent it was and almost like they were trying to keep me out of it almost like 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 oh we don't want him here because i was you know i'll be really honest with you i wasn't really the most like like you know, sort of, you know, still sort of geeky, you know, um, but I knew my music, you know, I knew my music better than most of them knew their music, and finally, I just decided to go, you know, and I just, you know, find, you know, I had always gone to, like, metal shows and arena rock shows and things like that, but, like, you know, and technically, my first show was Creator and Biohazard. But to me, that was more of a metal show, and Biohazard just happened to be playing. Yeah, and where was that at? What, what the, the Marquee. The Marquee. Okay, okay, okay. The the next show I saw, which was my official, what I say is my official hardcore show, was actually I think March of that of '91, and it was Boogie Down Productions, which is a really interesting to have them playing a hardcore show. But Boogie Down Productions, sick of it all, burn and rest in pieces, and it was. Just getting to the club. The marquee was on 20th Street, like way over on the west side. Yeah. This is back when that whole area was just a shithole. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know? And there'd be kids, I don't want to really say who they were, but they weren't from Bronx and they weren't from Manhattan. Well, fuck it, they were from Brooklyn. Um, <laughs> and they would wait for people to pick on people because you had the High Line right there. We never uh, called it that back yeah, then. It was course, just yeah. the train tracks. And they would wait under the High Line. And they would just fuck with people as they came down, you know, and like a couple of marquee shows I went to, if you saw them, you would just go around the block and go the long way. Yeah. Like, I'm not getting fucked with And they would just, they would fuck with people. Like, yeah. they were looking for fights. And they were looking for fights on the way out. So, you know, you'd forget about it, you'd have a good time at the show, and all of a sudden there'd be a brawl outside for no reason just because the day ended and why, you know. Um, but yeah, marquee... Was it, it was just that show was violent because you had a hip hop crowd there and a hardcore crowd there. The hip hop kids had no idea what hardcore was about. You know, I, there were a lot of hardcore kids that were are into hip hop back yeah, then. Sure, you sure. know, I mean, be, if you're from New York, you know, you're to me. You know, this is the capital. This is the spot for fucking hip hop. Yep. You know, 
there's no denying it. You know, I don't give a fuck. You could say the Bronx, Queensbridge, Brooklyn, whatever. New York, New baby. York, you know, right. fuck that West Coast shit. That's right. Um, you know, hip hop is the fucking is the Bronx. Hip hop is Brooklyn. Hip hop is Queens. It is Manhattan. Uh, well, all right, Staten Island. We'll give Staten Island props. A little bit with the Staten Island. No, we'll get, we'll give them props. They do got Wu Tang. That's right. That's they do right. got Wu Tang. That's right. That's um, amazing. so we were familiar with it, you know, and plus just MTV. I mean, we all sort of grew up MTV generation, you know, where, you know, when they brought hip hop onto MTV, you just, you know, you, you were getting forced to watch it whether you did or you know you liked it or not. And there's some hip hop to this day that I still fucking. Dig, you know, I, I dig more of the older style hip hop, you yeah, know, sure. like uh, you know, Slick Rick, fucking Run DMC, uh -huh. the Beastie Boys, which everyone's, you know, Beastie Boys has gotten, you know, there's a certain c culture that goes, oh, they stole the culture. I was like, dude, they embraced the culture and ran with it, you know, yeah, and yeah, they, yeah. they did throw out some fucking great stuff. Yep. There's just so much good hip hop, of course, you know, KRS One, without any doubt. But yeah, hip hop was has been ingrained to a certain degree in certain hardcore guys, you know, lexicon, you know, it, course, it's yeah. part of it. And it would become sort of part of the New York hardcore thing, you know, also down the road as well. Um, but yeah, it was a really wild show. There were fights. Um, there was a habit back then of putting like large objects in your sock, like a, like, and just swinging at people. That shit... Everyone goes, oh, that's a myth. No, I fucking saw it, dude. I saw someone swing a fucking double, like a, a, a D battery in a oh. sock at a Killing Time show oh, once. Boy. Another yeah. person, I remember, there was a thing that happened for a few months there where people would bring mace. And they would go to the balcony and just do a quick squirt of mace into the audience. And all of a sudden, everyone's choking to death. And you're like, what the fuck is going on? It was like a battlefield. It was like, yeah, yeah, again, sure. the day ended in why. Why not cause some fucking problems? Yeah. I mean, it it was just really, you know, when I got into hardcore, it was just a real, it was a real violent time to be in hardcore. Yeah. You know, there was no rhyme or reason to it. It was just fucked up. I mean, really was. Nobody really, you know, this whole like, 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 87, 88, 89 thing, you know, where like a youth crew or unity, that, that shit was out the window. It was every man for himself and, you know, fuck women and children first. I'm getting on that lifeboat now. Yeah, you know, yeah, it, yeah. it was really, it's really a dangerous fucking place to be. Yeah. You know, I never understood like the senseless violence that would happen at shows just because, you know, and, and I've seen, you know, and not, not for nothing, I've, not that I was ever really a part of it, but, you know, I got to know a lot of the troublemakers down the road. I'm actually friends with some of the former troublemakers to this day. Yeah. You know, and it was just, I guess, again, people just being bored or, like, fuck it, uh, you know. Because I think about, like, what we used to get into as kids on the block. Yeah. You know, we used to do, we used to go and do stupid shit. Like, here's a great story. So, summer of 1990... They were building a new building on the corner of York and 92nd Street. And this just to show you like what kind of like shit we would get into. So you, all of a sudden, you had all these new cars coming, you know, new people coming into, I guess, gentrify the neighborhood or, yeah. I mean, whatever. So during that summer, 41 cars got broken into. And guys would steal cars from other neighborhoods, bring them on that block, strip them. Mm-hmm. So one day, you know, we're bored. We decide, there's like 15 of us, we decide to flip over one of the cars. It's already been, it's already been like looted. It's already been, yeah, the sure. doors are gone, the seats are gone. So we flip it over. As we're flipping it over into the street, cop car pulls up. We don't run. The cops know who we are. You know, and they go, put it back. And, you know, and so we're like, oh, you heard the guy, man. So instead of flipping it back, we drag it on its roof into the spot. The cops circle block. We knew the cops were going to circle the block to make sure we did it. They come by and they, they, they throw one of those. Well, we did tell them to put it back. <laughs> you know, I mean, <laughs> that's when cops had a sense of humor in the city, you know. But the yeah, cops yeah. back then, too, were not above kicking the shit out of you and taking upstairs your parents. Yeah. 
You know, it was a little, I mean, yeah, you could say police brutality, whatever, but they did teach you a lesson at times, don't fuck around or you're going to find out. Yes. And there were plenty of guys who did fuck around and wound up getting locked up because yeah. of it, because they took shit too far. You know, like a lot of these, a lot of cops back then were neighborhood guys. Yeah, or they, sure. They came, they understood the mentality of this, the street kid element. So, you know, a lot of them were street kids themselves. They didn't yeah. take the, they didn't take the fucking job because it paid great. They took the job because it was a job. Yeah, that's right. You know, they're like, like, fuck it, man. If I work some OT and, and whatever, I can make a career this and get a pension. Yep. You know, and nowadays you don't really have that, you know, it's more of a militarized force and not that they're doing anything nowadays. Yeah, and very few live in yeah, no, New York City. Yeah, no, almost none of them. Out. They can't afford to. Yeah, yeah, yeah. They can't afford, not on that salary. Yeah. Not on that fucking salary. No yeah. way. But um, let's take a break for two seconds. I yeah, got to sure. pee. I'm going to have a quick... I guess with the instruments picking up musical stuff, um, like nobody in my... Uh, like nobody directly... Like my father wasn't like musically inclined like that. Neither was my mom. But my mother's side of the family, there was uh, my cousin Kevin and Brian. And they sort of sparked my musical interest. Because when I was a young kid, I remember, like, they had a house, uh, they still, I mean, the mother still lives there, but the house out in Wilston Park that we would go visit my Aunt Marilyn and my Uncle Charlie, and Kevin, the older son, had a, a little, like, room up in the attic, and I remember one day he's in the bathroom and hearing guitar wafting down and, like, kind of, like, creeping up his stairs and, like, watching him, just like, like, hey, what's that, you know, and just, you know, this is a early age, probably, like, like five six or seven and just it just perked my interest i guess and my cousin brian played the drums you know my cousin brian had an immense record collection so you know he would just let me kind of like go through his record collection and somewhere i want like there was always like an acoustic and guitar in the house i think someone would like left it there had like four strings on it never in tune you know, just kind of futz around with it a little bit, and at some point, I don't know what it was, like, I want to say maybe by, like, age 10, like, my father, I don't know why I wanted one, but I wanted a mandolin for some reason. Okay. I don't know why the fuck I went there, but I, I did, and fussed around with that a little bit, and by age, I want to say 12 or 13, you know, I, I, an electric guitar just appeared. Um, still have that guitar. Wow. And What kind of guitar is that? Uh, GNL Broadcaster. Huh. And it was, um, you know, it wasn't really like, I just was, I don't know what I was trying to learn on it. I think when I first got it, I was very enthused about it. And there was probably like two or three years where I really was in and out of it, like, like, you know, like most kids, they just, you know, like, you know, oh, shiny nickel, you know, you go over there for a little while. But I think it was by age, like, 16 or 17 when I really, like, it perked up for me. You know, it was just like, I just wanted to all of a sudden learn how to play, and a friend of mine across the way taught me the bar chord, and then I just kind of always learned by ear. Yeah. You know, I would you know, rewind the tape a hundred times and listen and I could pick things up and I'm not the most technical guitar player but I can figure things out on my own and like I remember my father wanted me to learn how to read music and he sent me to this place uptown and it was just, it was fucking terrible. I mean, I, I don't want to say the name of the place because they're still in existence but yeah. they were trying to teach me basically how to read music yeah, sure. and it was like single note learning how to play Mary Had a Little Lamb and, and shit like that. Not even learning how to like strum chords because yeah. I, I, I never aspired to be a lead guitar player. It never yeah, really sure. did anything to me because I, by that age, I wanted to be like, you know, Pete Townsend. I wanted to be Johnny Ramone. I wanted to lay in the rhythm, lay in the pocket, you know, and, and hit that open chord and fucking, you know, like everyone says, you hit that open A chord and you just like, like it's something... It charges you. Yeah, yeah. And, um, you know, and it just slowly progressed from there. Just, you know, got, you know, got into, like, effect spells and got rid of all of them. You know, just, and just, I don't know, it just kind of just happened. It, it didn't really happen or 
happens like naturally for me it sort of happened more organically it just i just like seep into things you know yeah, like sure. i would figure out things i think i learned how to really play in time by the first ramones record the old trick of the first ramones record had the bounce with the basses on like one side and the guitars on the other yeah he would just flip the bounce over just to play bass and then you would just be oh, like along. fuck i'm playing with the ramones and i'm, yeah. I'm johnny ramone you yeah. know and i mean the who is a little bit more intricate for me to try to learn because townsend likes to play a lot of outstretched chords and you know later on in life i did figure out a lot of it and to this day i still look at it and go dude what the fuck are you doing <laughs> you're making things difficult for me um but that was my thing i just wanted you know I don't know why I just gravitated to it. Like I think originally I, wa I wanted to play drums. I think that's really what it was. Yeah. And my parents were like, no, forget about it. Yeah. No, not in an apartment. You know, it just and I, I don't blame them. Uh, you know, but I just like sort of stuck with it. Yeah. You know, I, I just there was something about again hitting those notes and just like when I first started learning and and just making noise and trying to figure out my way about it. There was. You know, again, how to work at it. This it didn't really come natural to me. And, you know, there's times where I feel like it still doesn't come natural yeah, to me. Yeah, and I've been sure. doing it since, uh, you know, since I'm a fucking kid. Um, but eventually, you know, that turned into wanting to, like, make noise with others. And I think making noise with others started at an early age. Like, I was, I had a band that played in high school. Uh, like, we did, we got, we me and a couple other guys I sort of loosely knew. We were like There was a talent show coming up. And it wasn't just to play one song and out. It was like, you know, you could play like, I think it was, you had to play three songs. Yeah. So we made up three songs, and I think one of the songs, we basically played Symptoms of the Universe for like five minutes. Just, you know, just to, we just looped that thing until we kind of ran out of steam. And, and that's kind of what gave me the charge. Like, you know, I played in front of like, you know, however many people it was and just the charge of playing in front of people and people going, yay, you know, and like, 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 oh shit, you know, I'm, I, you know, is, am I impressing people? Is this the reward? And something about it, it yeah. just was like, kind of like, cool. I mean, later on it became just playing for me in my own little world. Sure. But back then, I guess it was just like adulation. Yeah. You know, that's really why I did it. And like I said, it just kept, going at it and going at it and you know it's hard to believe i'm 50 years old now i've been playing for more than like half my life at this point yeah it's crazy you know and it's you know i'm to the point where i just don't want to buy any more gear well not that came years ago i just it's it's not so much buying the gears where to fucking stash it <laughs> yeah, you know because we have other collections like books and records and you, you, something's got to go yeah something's got to go <laughs> um so when you started playing with uh, the kids, the other kids from Yorkville and the one one kid from Inwood, how old were you at that point? Uh, that was like 91, so about 17. Okay, all right. So you'd already you'd already been playing with other. I I was jamming like I yeah. jam with some some people here and there where I could. Yeah. Um, it was never like a full blown out jam. It was like you know. You'd tag along with someone somewhere, and they would let you, like, jam with their drummer. You know, hey, kid, yeah. you know, want to play with the guitar? Or, hey, you want to check this out? And, and that's really how that kind of started, I guess. Seven, yeah, 91, yeah, I think I was 17. And, you know, that, to be honest with you, being in a band at first, didn't know shit. Yeah. You know, I mean, it really didn't. You know, it sort of leads up into my experience with someone from the Bronx, um, because yeah. that first year, you know, 91, I played, I think, five shows. Three of them were in the same spot in Brooklyn, this little rundown shithole bar called the Paradise Club. By the end of 91, we had gotten a, uh, you know, we needed a bass player. Yeah. And... My singer's girlfriend at the time knew a bass player, Dave Mitchell, from the Bronx. She had gone to high school up at, up at Lehman. Yeah. And Dave was in a band, Violent Carnage. Um, I still break his balls about that fucking band. <laughs> but, you know, they, they were kids too. But yeah. Dave had a little more experience. They had played out. They had gone over the river and played in New Jersey. They had oh, wow. played places. So it was just like, 
I kind of need this experience, you know, and Dave came along and shortly thereafter, you know, we had to get a drummer because our drummer left and, you know, we got another character, Ray Maloon, and he was from uh, South Bronx, from 167th Street in Grandview, right off the Grand Conquest. Yeah. And those two got, you know, that was like our start of our, like, thing from the Bronx. I mean... Yeah, you had Ray that was from South Bronx, and, and and Dave was from Co-op City. Yeah. So it was like two different sections of the Bronx, you know. So, and that's when I started like traveling a lot, like like to different things. Like I, Dave would take me around to spots, like some of his old friends, and and you'd meet other people. But the weird thing with the Bronx was it just seemed like shows were so far and few between that, like. Like, I thought about the other day, like, how many places I've played in the Bronx, and it seems like I've probably played Staten Island more wow. than i played the Bronx. It just, it just seemed, things seemed to pop up, but through, like, with, like, Dave Schroeder, like, showing us little ropes on how to do things, which was very important for us. With Ray Maloon, that's where I met Mike from District 9, who at the time was in Close Call. Well, Close Call... Eventually turned to District 9. Okay. Just like what Out of Course sort of turned into Fahrenheit. I see, I see. You know, yeah. we, we sort of morphed into these bands with, you know, switching members and sure. just, you know, people got better and tighter and whatnot. But, you know, Ray had a place, had his, his mom was a super of the building. They lived in the basement apartment. Mike lived up on the second or third floor. Uh. And... Ray was like in some early renditions of Close Call with Mike. Ah, uh, okay. So the first time I met Mike, I believe, was when Ray came down to a, uh, you know, I guess audition or whatever. And strange how I even got in contact with Ray. Like with Dave, you know, that was, a, you know, it was, a, you know, I, that was a, that was a, you know, someone, a classmate. Yeah. I had a classmate of mine who hit me up. And she was like, hey, what's going on? How's things? Blah, blah, blah. I'm like, good, I'm looking for a drummer. He's like, I know a guy. And she was dating Ray's brother. Uh, okay. So the information got passed along. Hey, do you want to you know, come down and check this out and whatever? And he came down, and I believe he brought Mike in tow with him. Huh. So the first time we met, we met Mike. And, you know, so then now we're starting to meet other guys from the Bronx and you know now I'm starting to travel up to you know 167 you know on my own in 1992 and the Bronx back then you know I mean I grew up in a pretty wild neighborhood I know say what you want about you know you know you Yorkville but it was could be a rough neighborhood but the Bronx is a whole different animal yeah and so I mean it's pockets of different players from the Bronx and uh, I don't know something in the water up there um, I just felt that you know there was a lot of metal influence going on in the Bronx you know like a lot of people they didn't shave their heads and become hardcore yeah. they did both yeah yeah, yeah they yeah. wore the MC jackets they had you know the look going on they had no problem with wearing the metal t-shirts uh, they just, they embraced all of it, yeah. you know, and in certain, you know, sections, they just didn't give a fuck, and, they, you know, there was some, like, I, I was exposed with, I, my first show in the Bronx was a place called the Chippewa Club, and that was over by Westchester Square, which was, like, a couple blocks away from Lehman, and I want to say I was, like, March 92, yeah. and it was the first time playing up in the Bronx, and there's actually video footage of online, which is unlistenable and unwatchable it's all backlit it sounds like a fucking jet engine but it's a good document because it shows the kids up watching shows and it was the first time i was really like like oh there's something going on up here yeah you know there's a little bit more it wasn't a ton of people maybe 75 or whatever okay. people but there's something going on up here and ray played with a thing of uh with people from close called that day because Close Call was always flipping drummers. They, huh. they they had that perpetual problem where they couldn't keep drummers. It seemed like every couple of fucking months they were looking for somebody. And like I said, just met met a bunch of kids. I at that show, you know, 
met a lot of people that I would know for fucking years after that. Some got people I wound up even playing with just from that show. Didn't really know it at the time. Yeah. But, you know, again, going up to the Bronx and then go, you know, Lehman would have Battle of the Band shows, uh -huh. which were like these big things, these big deals up there. It was like, like they'd rent the real PA system. They had yeah. lights. They had production. They had fucking monitors for Christ's sake. Yeah, yeah. You know, like they had like, I don't know what the budget was for their Battle of the Bands. Because like, I've played high school, quote unquote, Battle of the Bands, you know, down the road, like, like we got, you know, someone suckered the, the faculty into letting them have a show there. And it was always just like, like two speakers on a stand in the corner. This was like full PA, full production. <laughs> yeah. Like you were playing an arena. And I remember I went to a couple of these shows and it's like, what the fuck <laughs> is this? <laughs> you know, but, you know, for the most part, a lot of these kids, some of them would go on to form bands. Some of them would go on to never leave the Bronx. Yeah, sure. Um, I also know throughout the years, there's, you know, this is this is nothing new. This is everywhere. What we call bedroom players. Yeah. Um, a lot of people are extremely good at their craft, but they're they're socially awkward to be on stage. It's not for everybody to get up on stage and and play. You know, some people get really like weirded out about it, like. Like, oh, uh, I, I don't know how to get to that next step. And I and that's anywhere you go. But there were so many bands from that era that I just don't really, you know, like I just ran into. Yeah. People like like you had, like I said, you had, you had Carnage. You had a bit, another band called Expire for a second. Not the Expire that's out today. Yeah. Uh, there's another band, Requiem. Oh, Requiem, yep. Requiem. There was Punisher or Punishment. Can't remember. There was a few other bands from the Yonkers era. Yonkers was full of metal bands. Oh, sure, sure, sure. Yonkers was Absolutely. full of metal bands. Yonkers and Westchester. Uh, you, like I said, you had another band. that were like a glam band called Leg Show. <laughs> we borrowed their drums a couple times because our drummer at the time didn't have a real drum set. Yeah. You know, so we had to always like borrow their drum set, and they got sick of that That's after funny. a while. Um, like I said, there was all these like random little bands but there was nowhere for these bands to really play you would have a lot of random bar shows yeah but there was never a like like later on there were some little things happening here and there but you know and even later on you had the church but that's sure that's we'll get Much to that yeah, but yeah. in the early days there was just you know something in the water because uh, again i knew about the brooklyn scene i knew about you know i met those kids i knew about there was some obviously there was something going on in manhattan there was something going on in queens with the bronx I, honestly you know i didn't really i knew about the i mean i've gone to the bronx like when i was a kid you know obviously you go to yankee games you go ice skating at fucking over in riverdale yeah you go to the zoo you know you go to you go to do discount shopping at some of the fucking stores that had everything and its mother um, but other than that, really never went to the Bronx to just, didn't really have family from the Bronx. Yeah, sure. You know, so sure. there was really no real reason to, like, the Bronx was somewhere we drove through to get to, like, our family and friends that lived, like, upstate. Yeah. You know, yeah. so you'd go past, like, you know, you'd go on the Hutch or you'd go on, uh, on the Cross Bronx or, you know, whatever, you just... That's it. That's all I really knew of the Bronx up until, like, I started having to go up there for band stuff. And, you know, then started meeting more and more people who wound up being in bands. And then, you know, just like I said, but the really there was never a real place to play. I mean, you had streets that was upstate, you know, which I think by 92, 93 was either closed or already closing. Yeah. You know, you had the lowdown which had shows actually for a f quite a few years. Um, they just tore that building down recently. And they had shows from, like, the mid-'90s up into the 2000s. Wow. But it was it was always kind of known as that shitty bar, you know, up in, like, Yonkers that, yeah. you know, like, oh, you could play up in there. You know, that was about it. And then later on you had 7 Willow Street up in Portchester, Portchester yeah. which was, like, had been doing shows for a while, but... That was, you know, that's like, you might as well go to Connecticut. Yeah. You yeah, might as well go to Connecticut. Right. You know, right. you, had, 
you had random spots like the Smoky Toot that was open for maybe two months. Then you had the Train Depot. The Train Depot, yeah. The yeah, Train yeah. Depot was an interesting one. Because in a short period of time, I think the Train Depot was only there for like, you know, maybe five, six months. And that, that might be being generous. But they had everybody play the Train Depot, you know. Like, Without a Cause played the Train Depot. Then Fahrenheit played the Train Depot. We, we were in a transition period oh, during that so point. Oh, so both Without a Cause. And well, we, we, I mean, we were still calling ourselves Without a Cause. Even though we had a new singer and new everything, we were just trying to figure out what we were doing. But once we realized different sound, different everything, it's time to get rid of the old moniker. Yeah. All out with the old and with the new. But um, the depot was an interesting spot because they had a lot of bands come up there. Yeah. In a very short period of time, like in the six months that it was open, I think we played that three of the three times, which is a lot for six months. Yeah. But as mysteriously as it opened, it, it disappeared just as mysterious. Then you had, like, the Black Thorn, which is not that far from That's here. That's right, but, just a few blocks down the road. Yeah, but never, that came later on, and at that point, that was a certain, certain personality was running the place. Uh -huh. And, you know, I don't know if I want to really give him credit or not, or, or whatever, but it just, you know, it wasn't my thing. It's I know like some later 90s, right? What? That was like later 90s, 90s Yeah, that was later 90s, 90s, early 90s, 2000s. Like and it yeah. was around for a handful of years. Yeah. And they did do some things up there. And there are people that love that scene. Yeah. I am not one of them. Yeah. I didn't want to put any money in that dude's pocket. I didn't uh -huh. want to associate with that fucking dude. Because um, he booked other clubs in Manhattan. So we knew. He still does, I think, right? What? I think he still does. Yeah, I think he still does. He lives in my neighborhood. Okay. <laughs> He's from my neighborhood. He's still, he's still uh -huh. wearing that fucking terrible wig. Um... <laughs> He was wearing that wig back then, too. Oh, my God. Like I said, I don't want to slander the guy, but, yeah, you know, yeah, he yeah. he was just another... I mean, I've... You, know, you play in a band, you're going to run into these characters that yeah. are just there to make as much money as they can from your work. And, you know, you get very little for, for your efforts, you know, where they change the rules. Like, oh, I thought I was getting a dollar pass. Oh, you get a dollar pass after 20 people. Mm. Oh, I see how this goes. Yep. So... And Malali's too, right? You, you play Malali, all right. Times you play yeah, there. Right? Yeah, let, uh, let me get into some. of There's a couple of spots I need to mention here. Malali Skate Park did shows from like '95 to about '97 or '98. I'm not really sure when the last show there was, but I want to say '97. I think they did three years. So how Malali's came about? There, was, the guy actually who who, who helped throw the shows actually still works at Malali's. I believe it's a uh, Casio or it might be Lou. I'm not really sure which one it was, but they they were fans of the music. Yeah. And be I guess they were able to, you know, they had no problem with the parks department really had not no problem with them throwing these. So the first like I think the first show they did was without a cause. And I want to say no, 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 it was Fahrenheit. It was Fahrenheit, yes, because it was it was like spring. We already had fully committed to that, so yeah, it was like without uh, Fahrenheit and District Nine, and I don't remember who else played that show, but you know we did a couple of shows. I think we played there every year they had a show up there, wow. and like a lot of times are you know like me and my guitar player Frank from Fahrenheit would help sit, run the PA or set the PA up, you, you know. Everyone sort of threw in and helped out, you know, at where they could. Um, for a short period of time there, they even had the Parks Department provide the stage. Wow. One of those rolling stages. Until someone got a bug up there because they saw the slam dancing and thought it was fighting. Of course, It's like, yeah. we're taking our stage. We're out of here. And then, you know, bands had to play on in the grass. Uh-huh. But, um, yeah, uh, Malali's... The biggest thing that ever happened in Malali's was Sick of It All. Yeah, Sick of It All. I was going to mention that. Sick yeah. of It All... You know, September 1996. And we had sort of heard rumblings about that for months. Because huh. a friend of ours, whose house we used to hang out with this guy, Joey Rampage, who had a band. He used to work at Bronin's Music. He had this band, Rampage. They they had more merch than shows. Like, you'd walk into Bronin's, there'd be Rampage stickers everywhere, <laughs> and shirts, and this. They only played three shows, and I saw... I played all three of their shows. <laughs> You know, the first two without a cause, and, and no, all of them without a cause. They played uh, Rampage with one of these bands, 
you know, they couldn't really, like, they were a band in theory. Yeah, yeah. And they played the Chippewa Club, then they played Metal Madness in 93, which was at some random church up in the Bronx, I can't remember where. Huh. That's a show we got to talk about. And then they played at Bond Street Cafe with us, and that's the only time they ever played. Wow. But there were a lot of bands like that. Yeah, they sure, would They would sure. just kind of pop up. They were, again, a band, you know, like, hey, I'm in a, you know, how many people did you meet? Like, yeah, man, I'm in a band. Yeah, they play once in a while, and it is what it is. You know, guys don't have their shit together where they can be a real band, you know. Yeah, yeah. Again, they like the idea of being in a band. But um, sick of it all, like I said, we used to hang out at Joey Rampage's house, and right next door, Lou, one of the UND guys, uh, which is basically was like a, like a BMX crew. I'm not going to try to remember what UND stands for, <laughs> because I'll... Fuck it up. Sorry, Lou. So, this was like their second year, and they were talking about, like, hey, uh, we could, I think we could get sick of it all up here. And they had already booked the year's worth of show, yeah. you know, the summer season worth of shows. And we're like, yo, we want to go beyond that. So, they, they wound up switching a lot of bills around to get the openers. Huh. And I'll be honest with you, I didn't have, I didn't think sick of all was ever going to play the Bronx. Yeah, sure. Uh, you know, it was like one of those things. Yeah, right. You know, it's just like, I've heard that before. Like, it's like, oh, so and so is going to show up. Yeah, okay. So, and honestly, I didn't believe it till the band showed up and they <laughs> jumped out. Yeah, 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 yeah. And they almost didn't play because uh, Pete had had, I want to say he had hernia surgery or something. Oh, shit. Like a couple of days before. And he was like, we got the word that, I was like, yo, Pete had to have hernia surgery. And we're like, well, they're going to sing about playing. But, no, he two days after surgery he was up there, but he he wasn't the same Pete everyone knows jumping around. Yeah. Put a couple of guys in front of him just to make sure he didn't get bumped into. He stood by his amp, but it was ferocious. There was I don't know how many hundreds of kids there. It was just it was insane that fucking show. And then the following year they had some shows, and I guess that was it. You know, I don't know. Funding got pulled for it. If the parks department said, "Listen, you can still run this the the skate park, but." No more that, shows. The, no, the, that music shit's got to go. You know who, who played with Sick of It All? Uh, Fahrenheit, um, the Six in Violence, the Wasted, which was uh, oh oh yeah, which yeah. was Chucky Brown's Chucky band. Chucky Brown's band, that's right. Chucky Brown and and, um, and they were like they were like just straight up punk kind of. Yeah, right? yeah, yeah, they, yeah, yeah. The yeah, I said yeah, it was I believe it was the Wasted us. Sex and Violence, Roguish Armament was supposed to play. They were like a hip-hop band. Yeah. And for some reason, they I don't even think they showed up. I, I just think... Um, but here was the funny part. So the guys come up to... The Sigma guys come up to us and they're like, Hey, guys, we got to like play in Boogie because like, Pete's like really hurting. So we're like, would you mind going on after us? I'm like, oh, fuck. <laughs> but at the same time, we're like, you know what? Fuck it. We, we played. We still played in front of at least half the crowd that was there for Sick of It All. Wow. Which was still like 200, 300 kids. Yeah. So, you know, sun was setting by then. It was like really weird. The the, the four train was literally going by every two minutes. Uh -huh. um, it was something to be seen. I mean, it really was. Like, there was just all these, like, I mean, it wasn't a lot of just Bronx people. A lot of people came up. People and over, and yeah. it's funny, I read stories and hear people's stories like, like well, I got fucked with on the way to the train. It's like, I didn't. Yeah. You know, I, I had no problems getting up here. But I I grew up in a neighborhood where you sort of like just minded your own. And if you don't look like a mark, people will more or less leave you the fuck alone. When you look like a mark, people are going to fuck with you. If yeah. it says, you got the words, mug me, you know, written on your face. They're going to fuck with you. Yeah, yeah. You know, you, you have this look of fear in your eyes walking around. People are going to fuck with you. Yeah. You know, you got to walk like you got determination in where you're going. But, uh, yeah, the, it was, those Malala shows are pretty fun. I mean, I, I saw a lot of cool bands play up there. But Sick of All was probably the biggest band. Yeah. That, and to this date, it is the only time Sick of All has ever played the Bronx. Damn. You know, I've I've talked to those guys since then, and, and it's just like hey, play the Bronx again anywhere. It's like there's nowhere to play. Yeah, yeah. You know, there was a point where they were going to play the church. Oh, really? And they were not. They there was no way those guys were going to be ready for that, that type of show up there. 
it was just one of those things. They would have had a hot. They would have got real security, yep. and because they would have tore that place apart. Oh yeah, for sure. You know, but the big show for the Bronx back in the early nineties was, you know, the Metal Madness nineteen ninety three show it was originally supposed to go down late February, early March of that year, and we had a blizzard. Oh. And day before the show, we had loaded in, you know, because. A friend of ours, Uchi, who's long since passed, um, he ran sort of like a community center. So he had access to things. And he was like, oh, I want to do a show, blah, blah, blah. Yeah. And we're like, okay, sure. So we lo he had this big-ass PA system, board, everything. The day before the show, you know, we actually loaded in the PA. We actually did... we. Tested the PA, sound checked everything, make sure it worked, set everything up, lights, the whole thing. Snows that night into the next day, blizzard, we had a can the show. Damn. He had a lot of his volunteers come over and t remove all the equipment that night in the snow and stash it at the community center. Fast forward to, I want to say it was May, that it got rescheduled for, a couple hundred people there, and for some Dudes, I've spoken to some of the young guys younger than me. They're like, "Yeah, it was the first time I ever went to a hardcore show because, like, show in the Bronx." Yeah. Where you was know? the church at? Do you remember like what line it was off? Or? Yeah, it was. Wait, what line up? Or what line it was off? Oh, line? I'd have to look on my phone. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But um, yeah. I remember it was without a cause, close call, rampage, <sighs> band called Morbidon, and there was somebody else, and I'm, I'm forgetting it, and. Some of the Bronx guys are gonna fucking kick the shit me when they see us because they're like, you should know better. But it was it was like a lot of for a lot of kids that was like their first show, you know, because some some people from the Bronx never really left the Bronx. Like they yeah. kind of stayed in their community, yeah. you know. And some people ventured out and did things and you know got into the city. Like all the close call guys for the most part ventured yeah. and they played other places in you know their backyard and a lot of bands. You had to. If you need, if you were a band and needed to survive, you had to play outside of the Bronx. And it yep. sucked. Yep. You know, it really sucked because there was never, you know, it's kind of like Long Island has the same problem where they don't, their clubs don't stay open very long. You know, they, they stay, like, you get VFW shows until someone busts the fucking toilet uh -huh. or they break, you know, the display case or something. And then those shows go right out the window. A bar owner will go, oh, there's people here. I'm going to make money. Until there's a fight, uh -huh. something gets broken, someone gets hurt, lawsuit. And, you know, clubs don't really last long in Long Island. Um, and clubs, unfortunately, never really took a hold up here. Yep. You know, I think you did, later on, you did have the church. And I did appreciate that the church did have shows. They had shows going for a while. And it was run by a couple of the teachers from Lehman. And then there was also Alfie's in Throgsnack. Yep. R.I.P. <laughs> yeah. Alfie's was all right. Alfie's yeah. was fun. I, I, I played up there. Me and Caesar from District 9 had a blues band that played up there a couple of times. Oh, really? Oh, wow. Yeah. <laughs> we wanted to just do a blues band thing, and I remember we did it. I remember one night they asked for us to play, and they said, hey, do you want to do two sets? So it was like... You know, two two hours, like two one hour sets. Yeah. You know, like we do a set for an hour, take a break for an hour to play another. Like, I think we play like twelve to like one or some shit, something crazy. But um, Alfie's was a shame because it had the potential. And there were some Candiria played up. There was some really cool things, and there is now. There's more of a scene scene up in the Bronx, yeah. and they are there are shows. And you also had Jimmy's Cafe that did shows. Yep. You still have places that do shows in the Bronx, but they don't last very long. Yeah, Jimmy, you know? I mean, Jimmy's is closing out too. Yeah, um, and, and Jimmy's had like a handful of shows. I think, again, it was an incident that, you know, problem maybe with the dancing, maybe under your drinking, I don't know. Uh, the church probably had the best thing going on, but they were very, very selective with who they booked. Yep. And in a way, I kind of don't blame them, but at the same time, I do blame them. Yeah. Because if you're going to open this up, you need to then control the situation, what comes in. You you know, you could 
try to control as best as possible, but you have to know what to look for and expect the unexpected. I remember when I was in District 9, I tried to get District 9 to show up to church, and they flat out refused. And they were like, oh, well, we, you know, it's like, your guys are going to bring some crazy element up in here. It's like, it's the Bronx, dude. What the fuck? What do you think's going to happen? Yeah, yeah. And unfortunately, a lot of the kids who went to those shows never really ventured out into the hardcore scene outside of that. Yep. There are a few people who did, like uh, Dave, who played in Enziguri. Yep. He was one of those kids who went to those shows out to where he was introduced to it and he went on to, you know, do things and, and play in bands and shit. And, you know, and there's, but like I said, they controlled, they, you know, it was a safe space for like the, the kids who went to Lehman for, yep. for, you know, they had, they had the, you know, that whole mindset of like, like, well, you know, there's a place for that 14, 15, 16 year old crowd to come and see an all ages show, which is great because I hate I hate twenty one and over shows. Music yeah, should sure. not be just for the twenty one and over crowd, you know. It's just like why are you denying them? It's not their fault that they're young, you know. It's not always about selling booze. I understand because you sell booze, you're afraid that uh but that's gonna happen regardless. Yep. You know, I was able to get booze when I was a teenager. Of course, yeah. I'm not even going to way. shows. Yeah. You know, I was able to get cigarettes at a young age and nobody you know the right person to, you know, pull off the scheme. You got it. But, like I said, I think what they did do is they did introduce bands to the kids. Yeah. And they did it for a while, and then they closed down, and then they did it again. And we actually did have a show planned for Crazy Eddie, the band I'm in now. We actually did have a show booked there, and then COVID happened. Uh, and then and then it never, it, the place just never opened again. Yep. Because they had, they had, like, phases where they were open. Like, I think they went through three. You know, they like they had their first initial run, which was, like, the late 90s and through early 2000s. Somewhere again in, like, the mid, like, 2000 teens. And then, again, they were started doing shows. They uh -huh. started kicking them up again, and then COVID happened. Yep, that's right. And Never again. Haven't heard anything. Never again. And, yeah. and, you know, and everyone... And then a new group of kids started doing shows. But there are places that do do shows around here. Yeah. Um, but they're kept... Very much on the hush. They are, yeah, yeah. yeah. They're, they're, you know, it's like it goes beyond asking a punk. Yep. You know, it's like they want, you know, they want a certain segment of people there, and that's fine, you know. But it shouldn't, you shouldn't be gatekeeping something here, especially when we've all been struggling to make something happen in the Bronx forever. I, I keep talking to friends of mine, like, man, we really need something up here. Yeah. We, you know. And it's not just for me to play. I don't give a fuck. I'm 50 years old. I do it for fun. Yeah. I like playing. But I think for things to grow, you know, you need something. That's right. And there are, like, like there are random shows that happen, like, at, like, like discos and things up here. Like, mm -hmm. like and it'll be, all, they'll have the disco lights and shit going and, and the back, you know, back projection shit happening. And you're like... This is just such a weird place. Like, <laughs> yeah. and those usually don't last very long either. Again, one or two shows, and then something breaks. It's a fight yep. happens. A bouncer doesn't understand what slam dancing is, and gets a little overzealous, uh -huh. and it gets a little out of control. Yeah. I mean, but again, I think the, I think Staten Island had a better hardcore like scene than the Bronx did, which is a fucking shame. I know. You know, Staten Island had a couple different spots over the over the thing but they were regular spots i think like i said except for maybe the church and the and black door those were probably the two longest running spots and alfie's to a certain degree yeah 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 you know but i think again i just really wish someone would be like fuck it let's do this yeah but it takes money it does yep and that's something that the bronx doesn't really have for the most part <laughs> no it's it's a forgotten borough it's always the last it always seems like the last on the list, and that might be actually a good thing considering gentrification. Yeah, I know. I, know. Um, I mean, I see what's happening, like, right there where the Harlem River is, you know, and all that development that's they're trying to slowly push north. They flagged that they started calling Moth Haven the Piano District, which is like, what the fuck is this about? I know. You know, it was never that, um, but it is. <laughs> and, again, it's... They're trying to push it, go, they're trying to push, you know, 
We need more housing. It's like plenty of housing. There's not enough affordable housing. Yep. I see housing all the time that sits empty because nobody has $2,500, $3,200, $3,500, $4,200 uh -huh. for a fucking one bedroom. I know. That's you insane. know, what about the people who live here and work here? Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, come on. I know. Bronx is the forgotten borough to me. I mean, Staten Island to me, whatever, whatever, it's New Jersey. Yeah. You know, if I got to take a boat or a fucking a mile long bridge, yeah, I'm in another, I'm in another state, my guy. You know, I'm in another state. When I have to go up the Delaware Bridge, I'm in all of a sudden I'm in Delaware. Yeah, you know. That's right. That's right. Uh, so to to take it back to without a cause and Fahrenheit 451 a bit, you, you mentioned. I mean, obviously there's transition in in members and all, but. Uh, describe the like transition and sound from without a cost to Fahrenheit four fifty. All right. Well, when we first started, you know, we didn't really, uh, we didn't really know what the fuck we wanted to do. I think yeah. with without a cause, we were almost kind of like this crossover band. Like we wanted to be hardcore, but we wanted to be kind of leeway, and we wanted to be kind of this. And it was just the sound of the time. A lot of bands, you know. We're doing sort of the same. They had the same crappy guitar sounds we all did because nobody had money for gear. Yeah, we we're all using horrible equipment, uh, writing the best we could, and then some bands shined. But with us, the first year was really just like, you know, figuring out what. The second year it was still figuring out, but playing a lot of shows, and it wasn't until like maybe ninety, the end of ninety two, you know, we need a new guitar player. And that's when uh, Frank Villalona came into the picture. He's, again, another Bronx native. I originally met him at that Chippewa show. And he came with the, from the recommendation of Ray Maloon. So they had known, you know, all these guys know each other. Yeah. And so he came down, you know, he had, you know, a little bit more of a metal lead style, which was interesting. But, you know, at that time, all of our guitar players were into metal. Um... And the first, you know, first handful of months were, you know, just, you know, we started like gelling, clicking, and the sound started to change a little bit. It wasn't so regimented into this crossover thing. Some of the, some of the Fahrenheit's, early Fahrenheit songs were actually old without a cause songs because they, you know, we started changing this formula up a little bit and, and things just started maneuvering that way. And by the time, like, by the time we turned it to Fahrenheit, we had a new singer, and we had a new bass player, and, you know, we eventually got another drummer, and the sound really changed. You know, I mean, that's when we started, that's when, hit, you know, Armando wears hip-hop on his sleeve. Yeah, 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 yeah. He, he is 100% he is hip-hop influenced. Yeah. You know, he does his thing, his thing is not your typical hardcore barking thing, it's that's a right. cadence. That's right. He has that hardcore cadence sort of thing going on, and and to a certain degree, so does Mike from District Nine. Yeah, yeah, They're yeah, both yeah. both those guys like embrace the Bronx and embrace that spirit and that ethos of the Bronx, that hip hop subculture that was going, and they love it. Like, you know, when we were when I was in District Nine, you know, Mike would just sit there and, and just be rapping all the time. We'd be driving to a gig, and he'd just like, "Oh, put that song on," and you know. Be like AJ, you know, like fucking just. I'm like, he knows every fucking word. Oh my god, you know, or, or the new rap language by uh, Tenacious Three. That's a seven minute fucking track, and he, knew and, and he knew every fucking word. And I'm like, like this dude is. Wow. I mean, it's a, it's a lot of, you know, let's get real. That's a lot of shit. That is. You know, but yeah, th them two, and uh, you know, Armando, you know, grew up. Like uh, the rest of us, we grew up as metalheads. You know, same thing with Frank. He's a metalhead, um, and we, you know, by the time Fahrenheit came around, I think we weren't really. Everyone was trying to be something. I think we never were trying to be something. I think we just took all the influences, threw them on the table, and we weren't trying to restrict ourselves to be this or to be that. Yeah. We were just going to be us, and however that came out, that came out. Now, did everyone like that? Fuck no. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Fuck yeah. no. No, you know, everyone wanted to hear. I, I want to hear beatdown parts. I want to hear mosh parts. I, yeah. You know, there's, there's hardly any mosh parts in Fahrenheit music. Yeah, sure, sure. You know, it, and again, you know, there were some people who didn't get what Armando was doing. You know, they, they were like, like, is he like 
rapping? Like, what is that? And it's just like, he's doing what he's doing, and it, and it fits. You know, I, I mean, Amando, in, interestingly enough, wasn't recommended by Frank. Amando came in, like, we had tr tried out a couple singers. Like, there were problems with our old uh, singer, Alec. Um, don't really want to get into that for this. Sure, that's fine, yeah. Um, but, you know... Like, he was out of the band by July 94. Okay. I got hit by a car during that same month. So I was laid up for the whole summer in 94. Damn. So the band was semi on hiatus, but semi trying to figure out what the fuck we were going to do. Yeah. Um, at that time, Frank, I think, was also fucking around with Mike. He was, Frank was eventually, I think, thinking about joining District, Crow's Call was turning into District 9. Okay. And Frank actually wrote the song Payback for District 9. Oh, really? Okay. Yeah. Uh -huh. Frank originally wrote nice. that. And I guess, you know, but Frank was doing both, and then eventually he just stuck with Fahrenheit. Yeah. Um, interestingly enough, four-fifths of Fahrenheit have been in District 9. <laughs> I remember you mentioned that, yeah. You know, yeah. And, and, you know. Including yourself. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, me, you know, and and my our current drummer in Fahrenheit, Lou Medina, who used to play in Cold Front and Breakdown, also played in District 9. Gary Mutley played in District yeah. 9. I could start pulling names everywhere. It's somewhat interchangeable, but not everyone has played in Fahrenheit. Yeah, it's, yeah, yeah. We've sort of stuck with that crew of guys, you know, until recently when we came back again and Lou Medina, who we, I had played with in District 9 and a few other bands, like we've jammed and we've known each other for a long time. And... Another Bronx guy, you know, again, Mondo always likes to say, and again, you're still the only white guy in the band. <laughs> you know, and I say that so when we get pulled over by the cops, you blame it on me. <laughs> <That's> <laughs> See, right. Someone's got to bail you fucking guys out. <laughs> um, but yeah, it's um, what we're saying. I, I got fucking sidetracked. Holy shit. <laughs> oh, uh, uh. I guess just about the all in the context of the shift in sound in Fahrenheit. Shit, yeah. So it was just we're just wearing our influences on our sleeve and not afraid yeah. to show them. Yeah. And we just, you know, we never that sound that we had never really was a you know a thing like we were like we want to sound like this. Like we, you know, we we loved burn, we loved quicksand, we yeah, loved sure. this. You know, at the time, you know. You know, got to remember, we also were coming out of that grunge thing. We loved a lot of the grunge shit. Uh -huh. And that was, that put, you know, a lot of people like, oh, grunge was just punk. No, it was its own thing. And yeah, it, yeah, yeah. It, that, the music didn't just pop out of nowhere. It was, sure. there was always alternative music going back into the 80s. You know, there was always shit going back that far. Yeah. It just, you know, industry picked it up and labeled it, and, you know, and Kirk Cobain couldn't handle the pressure of being the poster boy of grunge, and I get why, you know, he did what he did. And But I guess we were just, like, weren't afraid to, like, pull the influences, bring them in, and it was a hodgepodge of sound. Yeah. But what funny thing with Armando is Dave Mitchell, who was still in the band at the time, said, well, why don't we get Armando to come down and sing? And Armando had never sang in a band before. Uh -huh. Because we had tried out a couple people, and they, we had one dude come down. He was like a screamer, and it really was like, eh, it's too much. He had no, we had another guy come down, and he was like some Eddie Vedder wannabe. He's like, I'm like, what the fuck is it? Like, and that, you know, the our drummer at the time, Joe, that was one of his friends, and he was just like, yeah, this guy's not gonna work. Um, <laughs> and so he had to go, and then finally, you know, we just said. Mondo, why don't you? Because Mondo was Mondo and Frank grew up together. They they've yeah. known each other since childhood, you know. And Armando had just finished finished out with his uh, schooling up at uh, SUNY, so it was like, fuck it, man, I'll give it a shot. And it, it, just something clicked, you know. It worked, you know. And I don't know what it was. He just came down. He did his thing, and we're like, all right, fuck it, let's let's continue with this. And then we just kept going. Yeah. You know, and just very interesting. And at that time, during that same time, you had District 9 come out, you know, and they came out with their 7-inch on SFT records, and a great fucking 7-inch. Uh -huh. um, SFT definitely had their ear to the ground as far as the bands, because they also, during that time, they also had the VOD 7-inch, their first 7-inch. Well, actually, I think it was their second, but we'll just call it their first, for yeah. shits and giggles. Yeah, sure. Um, so that was the still record. And 
you know, and then eventually they put out Fahrenheit, they put out a bunch of other bands, put out Shutdown, they put out Roguish Armament, they put out the Six of Violence, but no Redeeming. I'm not forgetting people, Neck, uh, some other, oh man, they put out a lot of shit. Yeah. yeah. And, you know, District 9 for that first initial run probably played like 10 shows. Wow. Everyone, I remember me and Mike were bullshitting one time, and I bullshit with Caesar just to see if their stories connected. Because like, I was like, I was at a few, quite a few of your shows, but it always seems like, you know, you guys were, like, you played 20 shows, but it wasn't never 20 shows. I think they were on a lot of flyers. Uh, and, you know, or uh, this happened to us a few times where we were scheduled to play a show we never confirmed. I see. And, so you know, and, flyer, uh, yeah, because yeah, this show, this flyer's a pop up, and I'll look at it and I'll go, yeah, we turned that show down. We're, we're still on the flyer. Um, I think they played 10 to maybe 12 shows tops. But, you know, and when they broke up, we snagged our drummer. Uh-huh. We snagged Ray Green, and, you know, then Ray was our drummer till the end of Fahrenheit's run. But Ray brought, Ray coming as a band also brought in a whole new perspective. You know, because Ray was into, like, jazz, he was into funk, he was uh, into yeah, yeah. Tool, he was into all these weird, so again, it's like throwing curveballs at people. And I think by, like, 96, people started getting it. Because yeah. with that, our demo got weird reviews when it first came out. People were like, what is this? I, I, yeah. Again, you're like, I don't, under, I don't understand what they're trying to do. And because, again, at the time, during that time, you had, like, you know, Big bands that were coming out in '95. You had like Madball. Uh-huh. You had uh, VOD was kicking off. You had like this heavy sound happening, and then here's us with our weird ass chords and <laughs> doing this weird ass shit, and people are getting it. But it was more about groove and rhythm, yep. and, and and again this this sort of like there was almost a hip hopness about it, and it was like. And Mondo was definitely repping the fucking Bronx. Yeah, yeah. You know, yeah, yeah. same thing with Mike. The, both of them were big cheerleaders for the Bronx. It's like, we went out of cause. Our singer was originally from my neighborhood. But we were, at, you know, by the end of that band, we hit, were three-fifths Bronx band. Yeah, sure. We were accepted, but we were never officially a Bronx band. Yeah. Fahrenheit was a Bronx band. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, yeah. District 9, obviously, was a Bronx band, even yeah. though only three three-fifths of the other members were actually from the Bronx. Yeah. You know, Todd Hamilton actually grew up in my neighborhood, their bass player, uh, their second guitar player and bass player, and Ray Green was from Stuyvesant Town. Yeah. Down, down on 14th Street. So it was just like I said, we, you know, these two, those two guys especially repped the Bronx hard and, you know, brought in a hip-hop element that really, you know, I think not a lot of people, when people tend to try to do the hip-hop thing, I feel like it comes off as trying too hard, where they just let it flow off their tongue, and they would just spit fire, where other guys had to really work at it, and, you know, then if you're a white guy trying to do it, it sometimes it comes (laughs) off as fucking corny. Yeah, it does. does. You know, and people would always ask me, it was like, dude, it's like, how does it feel to be like the only white guy in a band of, with three Dominicans and Ray was black and Korean? Yeah. yeah. I was like, dude, I grew up around fucking people of all races and, and who gives a fuck? Yeah. It's music. The music unites us. You know, we all bring something different to the table. You know, everyone brought something else. Like Like Kevin Smith was like a big, the bass player was a, like, huge alternative, like, you know, when he brought in, like, the Alice in Chains type of deal, and, like, he was definitely, like, metal and grunge, and, you know, he liked some hardcore, but I don't think he really was, didn't get exposed as much as till, until, like, he got with us, because when he joined us, by that point, that's 94, I'm already, like, 21 at that point, and... Kevin came in like straight out of high school. Like he was like wow. 18. He still had braces on his teeth. And we would just fuck with him like mercilessly. He was, he was the, you know, even though at that, that age between like 18 and 21, it's not that far. Yeah, but it seems like. it. it there's a, a gap. Decade. There's definitely a yeah. gap there between like, like I could buy fucking booze legally, you asshole, you know. And we just, you know, 
we were just the first like few months. I mean, I the stories, but I can't tell them. I can't tell them because <laughs> I, I will get fucking canceled. <laughs> I got you. Um, but you know, we, he just got fucked with, and and even later on, even though he was in the band, he got fucked with because yeah. he was a young guy in the band, you know. But he was also one had the most balls to go out and like just say things and do things, and you know. And, you know, you could roll the shit out of a fucking blunt, let me tell you. <laughs> you know, that's, that's my partner, Cry with there, me and Kev. Um, but, yeah, he, um, the bands, like I said, it's, Fahrenheit Sound was just a thing. I don't know what it is. In fact, we're releasing two new songs, and it's, I still go, I don't know what the fuck this is. Yeah. You know, because no, it's not hardcore, and it's not, you know, there's certain parts of alternative music and rock and this yep. and that, and I'm like, what are we doing? It's like again, your it's, own thing. It's our own thing. I, yep. I can't explain it. Just people have to hear it when they hear it. That's really you know, true. but uh, yeah, we were like then you know, during that whole time, you had other bands around like Guadamente's. You know, uh, you had Dave Mitchell's new band Four in the Chamber, uh -huh. Billy Club. I don't know what time they started around. I want to say ninety six, maybe ninety seven. But I had known Martin from like the sure. Bond Street Cafe days back in the ni early nineties. Sure. So I knew all those guys, and then you had you know, you know like Phil Vibes with Irate, and they were, they were like, they were waving the flag for metal. Those fucking yep. guys. Yep, those yep, guys yep. love fucking metal. They still do. Yeah, they still do. They yeah. still love metal. Those guys wave the flag for metal. Um, but yeah, like Billy Club really came in with a, a metal ish sound. I yep. would say. Uh, there was definitely an aspect of hardcore to it, but it was, you know, it was the early stages of sort of that beatdown sound that, you know, became more prevalent later on. But absolutely. and Guadamente's was complete fucking metal. Oh, those guys, absolutely. Fucking, they love fucking metal. Absolutely. Barry and those guys. <laughs> um, and those were really, to me, there was a couple other bands that popped up around. You know, I just think that it was really weird, though, because again. Bronx had all this talent, you know, and again, we just didn't really have our own thing up here, you know, it was like, and I, I say like throwing me as in we, because I'm not from the Bronx, yeah, sure. but I, I feel like I earned my place in the community, especially the shit like going to hang out uptown, like on random days, just getting fucking, getting stupid, you know, yep, with yep. the guys, so to speak, uh, I mean, a couple stories, you know, like, for instance, like, going up to Caesars to go hang out, go fucking smoke weed, there there used to be this, uh, we'll just call him Dread. Yeah. Um, and Dread lived right next door to Caesars' parents' place. So we'd go over to Dread's house, get fucked up. You know, Dread would, uh, Dread would sell blow. Yeah. And, um, one day it's, you know, I always... I'm a, I, I still fuck up dominoes because the way the guys from the islands play dominoes is they count. Uh -huh. They're counting the, the tiles constantly. They're, they're keeping track of every number that's been laid out where I look at it as like, that's a six. I got a six. Yep. Not thinking now, those guys play dominoes as partners. So if I'm sitting across from you, you're a partner, and then these two guys are partners. And no one wanted to be Dred's partner, so they would kind of like stick me like a like deer in headlights with Dredd. And be playing, and also I'd be like, you know, slapped out something. Be like, white boy, you fucked me up. You locked me out, white boy. And I'm like, oh, he's gonna fuck me up. And then you know, and meanwhile we're all smoking weed, and you know, we're we're passing it around, and fucking, he goes, that's it, no more aluminum for the white boy. Cut off, man. You know, he just, just just totally like, and like I'm afraid of dread in a way because, like before, I fucking. Dredd would have his Domino's table set up downstairs, and fucking, one day I'm, I walk up to Dredd, hey, Dredd, what's up? I was like, yeah, man, what's going on? You know, and it's like, I see this big duffel bag sitting next to him. I'm like, Dredd, what's in the, uh, what's going on? Going somewhere? It's like, nah, man, got to be prepared. He fucking unzips it, it's a fucking sawed-off shotgun. Oh and I'm like, right. you got it, Dredd, all right, we're good. No more questions. <laughs> yeah, I'm good. Well, let me, let me, I'll, talk, I'll get into, well, I'll talk about that and I'll talk about cops. Yeah. Right, is it rolling? <laughs> yeah. Yes, All right. Yep. <laughs> yeah. Uh, if you want, here's a fun story. Um, so Fahrenheit was getting courted 
by a bunch of different labels. And one of the labels we got quoted by was Victory Records. Tony was really wanting to sign us. So every time Tony came to town, he would take us out to dinner or drinks. And we learned from like guys in bands like H2O, it's like, order the most expensive shit on the fucking menu. Uh -huh. And we would order the most expensive shit on the menu. And like, one day we had a, we, they finally, we were on tour, we were going through Chicago, we had a day off, so we're, alright, we're gonna stop at Victory, we have a chat. You know, Tony was gonna, you know, do his whole schmooze act with us. So we went into the meeting, um, we knew we were gonna sign to Victory, it was just, we weren't really, we would have been lost in the shuffle, maybe we wouldn't have, who the fuck knows. Um, hindsight, you know, probably better off we didn't, because... A lot of people's songs and rights were sold to another company, and there was a lot of bullshit. But at the end of the meeting, Tony goes, hey, you can go down to the warehouse and take what you want. You don't tell motherfuckers from the Bronx to take what you want. We had a friend of ours that was working um, at Victory at the time as well, and he had to do the invoice for how much we took. <laughs> And he told us how much we took. And mind you, this is in this was December nineteen ninety seven. We took thirty four hundred dollars worth of merchandise. Oh, now I don't know if that's net or cost. You know? Wow. I don't know if that was retail cost or their cost, but oh thirty four hundred dollars. Guys were <laughs> guys were oh fucking ding. You don't tell people to Take what you want, especially motherfucker from the Bronx, because they'll take everything out of your fucking apartment. Oh my god! But so speaking of the Bronx, so a couple of guys, uh, Frank for the longest time worked at Pabronin's Music, which is on Tremont, and he worked there for a few years. And w w we had a transition drummer between our first drummer Joe and Ray Green, this kid Joel, who actually also play drums at one point in close call. Wow, okay. So, the, again, the fucking the district, just, everything, yeah. everything comes around with us. Um, you know, those two bands are basically brother bands. You know, we're, we're very integrated with each other's history, whether we like it or not. Yeah, yeah. So, I would always go up to Bronis to go hang out, you know. It's not like other music stores where, you know, after like five minutes they throw you out, kid, what are you doing? You're going to buy nothing, get it the fuck out. Yeah. You know, I could go up there and play fucking all day if I wanted. And I knew afterwards, go over to Frank's house, you know, Frank and Armando had a uh, had a place up on uh, Hoffman. Oh, okay, okay. Like, not that far from the university. So, it was like, that was known as a, the, the party house, you know. And it never failed. I would cut down. I wouldn't cut down Fordham. I cut down. I think it's One Eighty Fourth Street to get to Bronin's. Yeah. And it it seems like every other time I would go down there, uh, the cops would stop me. Always, it would be like, "Hey, buddy, come here. You got any ideas?" Like, "Yep. What are you doing up here? I'm going to go visit my friend at Bronin's, or I'm going up to One Eight Seven in Hoffman." And you know, I'd get put against the wall. I'd get my pockets thrown. And I was smart enough never to bring my own weed to the Bronx. Yeah, yeah, Because yeah, yeah. being, being a white guy, fucking, the only white guy except for maybe the college, you know, because the college kids weren't going down that side of, of, of Fordham. Yeah. You know, they just weren't. Sure. You know, they, they were going literally from the Metro North uh -huh. to the train station or, or to the subway, and that was it. You know, they had their own little section. And, and the thing was, I was sort of used to this because later, you know, like I said, later on growing up in the projects, the cops would never believe a white dude lived in the projects. It yeah. was just like, yeah, white people live in the projects, dude. It fucking it happens to all of us, you yeah. know. It's people of every race and nationality that live in the projects. It doesn't fucking matter. It's poor people everywhere. Get used to it. But yeah, cops would ta constantly fuck with me. It was just like, you, get, you know, get the car. Guy thing? No. And like I said, the first time it happened, I said, yeah, I'm not, I could get weed in, in, in the building that I'm going to right now. I don't need to bring my own supplies. For sure. I could get my own supplies when I'm there. 
But Bronin's was another central kind of... Uh, Bronin's music was sort of another central place because you had a couple of music shops up in, you know, up in the Bronx, but Bronin's really was the place if you lived in that part of the Bronx. Um, it was owned by a father and son team. The, the family still owns that entire block. They bought, they had, they bought that block way back wow. in the day, and they, they still, I believe, own the, the property that it sits on, along with the properties that are behind it and next to it. Wow. So, it was like, you know, you could run into almost anybody coming to Bronin's, you know, and everyone played the shitty, you know, Enter Sandman riffs or the Nirvana riffs or <laughs> everything else that was popular at the fucking time. Um, it was fun going up there, you know, conversing with people and just, you know, make noise for a couple of hours and go with Frank afterwards and then fucking you party out of his, his apartment. And that became a crash pad for everybody. When Mondo moved out of that place, Mike District 9 moved into it. Ah. And then it really turned to a fucking chaotic scene. <laughs> um, but that's a that's a story I don't know if I want to tell. I sure, think sure. I would rather let Mike tell that one. Mike, you should really tell some stories from that place. Um, but speaking of music stores, you really you had a couple of record shops here and there yeah. that sold the music. You had There was a place on Bruckner. I was talking to Dave Mitchell about this. He can't. He's eventually going to try to figure out the name of the record store, but they sold hardcore and punk and metal, which is like really rare to see on Bruckner. And would they do de like demos from? I think they did carry demos. Wow. There was another place up in Yonkers called Rock and Rex. I've, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. Uh, actually, you know, to throw a plug out there, Tony actually, Tony actually put this out. Tony from Rock and Rex. Uh, you can get it from wherever. Um, but. Tony would had a record store up there from like 1990 to about 94, 95. Yeah. I know Without a Cause played in his record store. Yep. I want to say maybe Fahrenheit did, but it's one of those memories that's real foggy. But Tony would just kind of like, he was very welcoming. You could sell demos in there. He'd push the local music in there. He had, a, he had AFI up in there in the early days. And it was like a smallish space, right? Yeah, it was really. Yeah. Uh, it was it was long like a box car, yeah, maybe yeah. not just as wide as a box car. I think Billy Club played there. Even. They may have. Yeah, yeah, they. Yeah. I don't know if Billy Club was around. <laughs> uh, maybe what? Maybe it was Guatemala. A lot of bands did play through, you know, Rock and Rex, and Tony would always be pushing, you know, different music onto people and let people hear things and you know this that and the other thing and it was just it was kind of nice to have sort of a place that sells hardcore music and punk music and metal music because you don't really have those places yeah you know i mean you have them in the city you have excuse me you have generation records you have a few places up in connecticut boston has a few but again we don't really have dedicated shops anymore up here or you know i mean hardcore music i mean it's readily available online that's right you know i mean you could buy this stuff online anywhere nowadays between like R rev hq or discogs or whatever i mean but nowadays everything is digital so it doesn't really matter i mean i don't think most people give a fuck where they get their music from now yeah you know if it's accessible on your phone you know it's, you know, that's majority of people now listen to shit on their phone. Yeah. It's, you know, nobody has big stereos. I mean, I do, but, you know, a lot of people I know have Bluetooth speakers. Yeah. That's it. That's right. You know, but yeah, Tony was definitely was, uh, he's still around. He still shows his face. He, like I say, he put out, he want, he was hawking crazy Eddie to put out a seven inch for the longest time. And finally we were like, okay, you know, and we like agreed to it and it's doing its thing and. But it was nice that he was part of that community, let people play up there. It was another place, again, another place to play, another place to go see shows at. Yeah. Because we didn't, again, we didn't have anything. You know, Lowdown, talk about the Lowdown a little bit. Lowdown definitely got some acts up in there. Um, Lowdown, there's definitely, over the line, you know, and, you know, I don't care what people tell me, but, you know, when you go over the line into Yonkers, it's upstate to me. Sorry, guys. It just is. Um, like, there's a whole other world of bands up there, and yep. it's a lot, it's a lot of cover bands, a lot of metal bands. 
you know, and like I said, there was a lot of metal bands from like the late 80s and like early 90s that would play all these random spots that just aren't around anymore. But Lowdown got, you know, got some decent sized acts, but Seven Willow Street got national acts. Bigger, bigger venue, more production. Fahrenheit actually played up at the up at Seven Willow Street with Motorhead once. Wow! Really weird wow. gig. We played up at well, we played Seven Willow Street like a few different times, you know, with varying degrees of success or failure, depending on how you look at it. And um, Motorhead show, we're all like, we get the call. I think the Motorhead show was on a Wednesday or a Thursday. Yeah. We get the call. Monday or Tuesday about it. Like, guys want to open for Motorhead. It's like, yeah. Fuck yeah, man. Let's go. Yeah, yeah. You know, so we all, we all pack the gear up, head up there. The fucking track the trail and the bus is sitting outside. We're like, holy shit. It's early. So we're like, all right, load in. Motorhead's gear is already on stage. We're like, holy shit, Motorhead. Wow. Fuck, man. This is going to be a great show tonight. So... You know, we set up, we're, we're the first band, there's another band, and then Motorhead. So we set up, it's like an hour before doors. Go outside, we're thinking it's going to be a fucking line down the block. Get outside, nobody's outside. Interesting, okay. Yeah. Well, it's, it's a weekday night, you know, it's early yeah. still, I'm sure it'll pack in. So, doors open, five or ten people trickling. Damn. And then that's it for a while. We play to like, 10, 15 people, maybe. You know, we got to meet Lemmy. It was cool. Yeah. Um, then the next band goes on. There's still 5 or 10 people there. Maybe 15. Motorhead goes on. There's 20 people there. They did not fucking let up because there was 20 people there. They played easily at 110, 120 decibels. Oh I went to the 7-Eleven. I was a couple blocks away. And you could hear them crystal clear in the 7-Eleven. Wow. They were just punishingly loud. Like, I l had to leave at one point. Besides going to 7-Eleven, we're standing there, and it was, like, just getting pushed into the back wall. Like, <laughs> I, I, I can't breathe. It's just, The sound's just compressing my chest. Wow. Apparently, they were taking shows. They were on the Ozfest that year, so they were taking shows on the off days. Ah. Uh. They only had, like, a day to announce that they were playing there. Oh, so shit. So, by the okay. time it got, the word got out, it was already too late. Nobody knew that Motorhead was even fucking playing up there. So, we got to play, basically, a private gig with Motorhead. That's insane. But I, I was, like, confused about it. I'm like, why is there only, like, 20 people here to watch yeah, fucking yeah. Motorhead? Because we had played that club before. We had played that show with a bunch of different bands and had that club packed out. Yeah, sure, sure. Like, so, to play with, like, Motorhead, there's nobody here. I'm like... This is fucked up. Dude. Weird experience, yeah. You know, wow. but another place, great venue, had a good sound system, had a built, had for the most part a, a pretty steady, like, you know, you had the kids from the Connect, over the Connecticut line coming, you had a lot of Bronx people that would show up to those shows. It was right, the Metro North Station wasn't that far away. Same thing with sure. Lowdown. Metro North Station wasn't really that far away. The only thing I sucked is you missed that last train, you were stuck. Yep. You know? Again, it's just it's just a it's just so shitty that there's you know, literally you had to to see good shows. You had to go outside the Bronx to see good shows. Yep, yep. There was another place that was only did like two or three shows called the Blue Frog. Oh, I've 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 heard people mention that before. Blue yeah, Frog yeah. was like at the end of the Four Line by Woodlawn. It was just a bar. Yeah, that had a stage in the back. It, I think they did like two or three shows there. That place disappeared. There was an. I want to say there was another place to, like, just, you know, you had Streets, but again, Streets was, like, as I was getting into the music, that place was on its last legs. Yeah. But a lot of bands played up in Streets. Sure, sure. You know, but again, a lot of, you know, guys in the Bronx, a lot of talent fucking comes from the Bronx, they just don't have a scene up here. Yeah, that's right. You have a scene of people, but you don't have a scene to play. That's right. You know, it just it's just shitty. Um, when you think about it, like, Look who's come out of the Bronx. I mean, besides all the great jazz musicians that have come through this area, we have Charlie and Frankie from Anthrax. Uh huh. They're from here. Yep. Ace Freely. Uh huh. From here. You know, uh, I think. Ross the Boss Friedman from. I want to say. I think 
was Leslie West from here, or was he from Long Island? Or, oh, no, what it is, Frank Papillardi is buried up in Woodlawn. That's oh, what yeah, it is. yeah, yeah, yeah. That's I sure, think yeah. he might have been from here. You know, it's amazing. I love Woodlawn Cemetery, by the way. I know. It's, uh, it's so much it's history under your feet and in front of your face. Yes. Yeah. You know, it's basically Greenwood. You know, it's, they're, to me, that's their brother and sister cemeteries. Yeah. Exactly like same almost type of layouts, you know. For sure. But, yeah, like I said, uh, one, the 187 house up in Hoffman was pretty wild, though. Um, you know, it was a top floor. Anything that could have happened would go happen. There was a guy, Tattoo Tony. He, had, he was the third roommate. He had a, a room. I don't think I ever saw the inside of it. Because he was just taking tattoo appointments in his apart in oh his room, my God. <laughs> so there was always like. Any some... of your tattoos come from him? No, no, <laughs> no, no, no way, <laughs> no. I, I, I'm sure he did great work. I couldn't tell you. Um, he would kind of come out to the kitchen every now and again. He like, like you'd be like, Here you go, Tony. You know, and he would disappear back into his cave. You know, but yeah, it was it was it was like a frat house. Almost. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It was just like there was a big. Fahrenheit mural on the wall of our fucking first like EP cover. Or something wow. came. I think Tony actually did it. It just anything that could go missing would go missing. <laughs> <laughs> so, wait, speaking of your first EP, why don't you talk about the experience recording that and the other EPs you've recorded? Well, we only we, the thing with Fahrenheit is we didn't have a very large recording output like this. Yeah. This thing that I brought up, this is a a discography right? which is just basically. Um, you know, just whatever we had out. It's a demo. Uh, New yeah, York we had a demo. You were on. We had right? well, well, we had a de we had the de the demo. Well, actually, New York's hardest we recorded first. Oh, okay, okay, that was first. Every, okay. But it, although it came out second, uh, okay. there was a delay of about a year and change for it actually coming out into the world. Um, but we wound up recording the demo at the same place because we liked working. It was at Big Blue Meanie, um, out in Jersey. We were offered, I think District 9 was actually supposed to be on the New York's Hardest originally, uh, okay. and there was something, something went down, I can't tell you what it was exactly, but we wound up getting the slot, um, and that, that comp was everywhere, everyone had that fucking comp, when we would, when we would go on tour at places, a lot of bands that we toured with, they, you know, we'd play our EP shit, nobody heard that, the minute you play those New York's hardest. It's like everyone knew it. Everyone yeah. had it. It was everywhere. It was amazing how fucking far and wide that compilation really got. It, you know, played in California, and you know, they didn't give a fuck about the EP. Those two New York's hardest tracks came on. Bam! Fucking instant gratification. That, wow. and, you know, playing covers. But, um, yeah, I mean, the demo was done fairly fast. Um, we wound up making 15, uh, 1,500 copies of it. We, up, they, we only sold them for like a dollar to Bleaker Bob's because we wanted, we didn't really give a fuck. We just wanted them in everyone's hands. Yes, yeah, sure, Every, sure. We, you know, when a lot of times we would give them away for free. We literally gave, like, I'd say a good portion of those were just give me's. Wow. You know, where other people were just like, oh, demo's five bucks. I'm like, no, just have it. And we, we did like a nice looking, like, real demo. So I've always, you know, when I was a kid, you'd make a demo. High speed dubbing, which was not a good way to dub tapes, by the way. <laughs> Everyone's like, it's the younger kids are probably like, what the fuck's high speed dubbing? <laughs> um, but, you know, at that time, you know, demo, you know, we wanted to do a good demo, so we recorded the demo, same place, Big Blue Meanie, New York's Hardest. Then after that, we wound up doing uh, the thought of it, which was, went to this guy, Dan Wise, and he was a friend of. Howie Abrams, who worked at Roadburner, Howie Abrams is still a friend, um, and took like a you know took like five days to do the whole thing, soup to nuts. Yeah. You know, nowadays I do a fucking like crazy. Eddie records a whole EP in like four hours. You know, I just I can't sit in the studio that long. I yeah, get, sure, sure. I get fucking antsy. Um, but when in that came out on SFT Records, Kevin Gill did a great job with it. But you know, being an independent record label. It got pushed back by a few months. You know, I think, I think it originally came out at. It was supposed to be out, like, I think by the end of '96. I think it might have been the beginning of '97 by the time it came out. But you know, it is what it is. 
Then we're on a couple other comp. We were on the ARA comp, anti-racist action comp. Uh, gave them a song. Uh, there was a record label in Japan called, I want to say it was called Addicts Records. I might be wrong. I might be right. But they want, originally, they had interest in buying the licensing from us for the uh, EP. Yeah. But their whole thing was, they I guess they wanted to license it, and the idea was for us to go to Japan at some point during that. Uh, so, But they wanted, you know, us to record some more songs for it to make it a full length for them. Sure. So it was easier for them to be like, hey, we could get this band over here, blah, blah, blah. I think they had the whole, like, rigmarole, like, where they, you know, they licensed music, they brought bands over, they did bookings yeah. and such. They had a lockdown on that. So... Went up recording a bunch of songs for that at a studio on, I think it was just called Ludlow Street Studios. Yeah. Not there anymore. Uh, Ian Love from, who was in, oh, what fucking band was Ian in? Anyway, Ian Love, he wound up playing with Walter from Quicksand in Rival Schools. That's what mm. it was. He's been in a few other bands. And Davide, who was a bass player for Orange Nine Millimeter for a minute, they put their money together, had a studio, I think. The studio was only open for, like, a few months. Yeah. Went down there. Everyone, we did our thing. And then we just wound up recording a bunch of songs that uh, never came out. We had a development deal with Zomba Jive. And what it was was a publishing deal. So, Howie Abrams had, you know, Howie jump ship from Roadrunner. Wound up going to Zomba Jive. And he always said, we knew we'll never get signed to Roadrunner. It yeah. was just never going to ha- you know. Yeah. We weren't really Roadrunner's thing, but Howie was always like a cheerleader in the corner, and he's like, if I get the right opportunity, I'll help you, hook you guys up. And then we wound up recording a bunch of songs at Purple Light Studios, which took a while, and the idea was to shop that and either get a deal or use that to get a, another, to go back in the studio and re-record them. Really wasn't sure how that was going to work out. You know, and then by that point, the band was sort of done with it themselves. Yeah, I see, I see. You know, we, we were, you know, we were having a lot, you know, guys were just not getting along like they used to, and it, was, it became a job. Yeah. You know, and at some point during that time, I think literally, like, Farron and I broke up 2000, uh, I think I want to say June or July 2000, and by that September, I had joined District 9. Ah, uh, I see, I see. Because District 9... Even though District 9 lasted for only 1995, they would do little pop-up shows. And what they would do is they would use Ray and they would use Kevin. And Caesar would jump on and might, they would play as a four-piece and they would yeah. kind of jump up. A lot of times during Fahrenheit sets and they would do like, you know, like they would do like a few songs. And they would just do like these little random pop-up shows. So Mike, I guess, I don't know if, what happened, but somehow I ended up in the band. <laughs> and I wound up in the band for 13 years. <laughs> That's kind of what happened with Gary and Billy Club Sandwich. Yeah. <laughs> it's just wound like up I wound up. Because <laughs> District 9 did come back again in 96 for two seconds. Gary played in that version along with Lou Medina and some other people. Yeah. They only played one show and that was it. They were done. Yep. But I joined the band and. The band was on and off again for those 13 years. It wasn't 13 solid years. It was like we did some shows and we wouldn't play for a year or two. Someone would tell them to go fuck themselves. And (laughs) next, you know, and and random people were in the band. Caesar was in the band. Then he was in the band. Then he was in the band. You know, it's like this rotating chorus of people for the longest time. Like, you know, like Gary Mutley was in one version with me. Then Todd was back in. And then, like, Pete LaRusso was playing drums, and Lou was playing drums, and then Sky Rafe was playing drums. And <laughs> it was just like, it was a rotate, you know, if Mike got pissed off, guys were just out of the band, yeah, you know? Sure, it was just, sure. But, you know, the band, you know, that band was a lot of fun to play in, but very dysfunctional. Yeah. You yeah. know, like, I, there's a reason why they were only around in 1995. Yeah. You know, they, they were a great band, but they were the guys who couldn't shoot straight. Yeah, sure. You know, like, they, they had the right intentions, but they couldn't, like, you know, no matter how hard I, you know, because at that point I had, like, my experience with Fahrenheit, so I knew how to run a band. I knew how to do things in a band. And trying to get Mike or Caesar or anyone, you know, like, like 
uh, now I get it. Now I know why. But people love those guys, you know, yeah, and those yeah, songs sure. are fucking fantastic songs, sure. you know. I Absolutely. mean, to this day, you know, I get just as many questions about that band as I do any of my other bands. And, you know, I was lucky enough that when we got the lineup of, uh, I think it was me, Caesar, Lumadine on drums, Todd Hamilton on bass, and Mike, I was like, you know what, this band has to record something. Yep. This is a killer fucking lineup. Like, everybody in that band was a player. Like, everyone had... I mean, we were all loved music, but by that point, we were all, like, extremely proficient at our instruments. You sure. know, we all had grown up together, all had played alongside each other or with each other. So we all knew each other really well. The band clicked. I was like, it'd be a real fucking shame for this band not to record. And we wound up recording their second thing, South Bronx Memoirs, yeah. and I thought it was, you know, fantastic. But, you know, shortly after that thing came out, I had to exit the band because it was just, things were happening, and I just had to go. You yeah, know, sure. it was like, I left on my own accord, and, you know, and they've, they've been back since, here yeah. and there, you know. But, you know, Mike's living out in, you know, Bumblefuck, wherever the fuck he's living. Colorado. Or <laughs> Colorado or, or, or Arizona. Arizona. I always like forget. Arizona. Yeah. So, you know, but, you know, he's doing well. And, you know, hopefully we, you know, we see another rendition of this band again soon. Yeah. Um, but, yeah, that was playing with Mike in a band compared to playing with Armando in a band. There was always room for adventure, let's say, with Mike. <laughs> you know, you never knew what was going to happen, what you were going to get yourself into. Um, Mike's a wild boy, you know, Mike was a wild boy back then and there would just, shit would just happen and you would sit there going, there's something, again, there's something in the water up here. I don't know what it is, you know, there's some, some guys are just wild guys and not saying that any of the guys that I played with in Fahrenheit were not wild. They had their, they had their weirdness and their quirks too. District 9, you know. You put it's like if you put Mike and Caesar together, especially during certain times, it was like watching like the Toxic Twins. It was like Joe Perry and fucking you know <laughs> Steven Tyler or like Chief Richards and fucking um, Mick Jagger. Oh my god! They had that. It was like that type of thing, and you know, and you know, let's also while we're at, we'll talk about Caesar, another fantastic musician. You know, he, he's just. I don't think Caesar ever really wanted to be in a hardcore band. I think Caesar always just wanted to be in a band. Yeah. And his feet just happened to land in that band. And, you know, like, like I've played a lot of different projects with Caesar. And, you know, dude is extremely talented, very proficient at what he does. But I just think somehow he just, like anybody else, it's like, we need a guy, you'll do. And they just. That thing of not wanting to be in a specific band sort of makes that thing sort of stick out and become yeah. special. Yeah, sure. You know, and, and that's what, like, so Caesar, you know, he was a different type of player. He was also, you know, fairly young when he was in District 9 the first time. I think he was still in school. Wow. Um, I want to say he was still in school, although they might have been lying to us and he might have actually been 18. Yeah, yeah, he might have yeah, been 16. yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. But I he was young, younger than all. He was all he was people. younger than the rest of us. Yeah, sure. You know, C Caesar was another guy who he came around. We started fucking with him. And, yeah. Like there was an incident. I like to tell this story because it's sort of PG. Um, we're traveling up to play New Paul's at the at the college, and you know we ha we're like half the band is traveling in the van. Van the other guys are getting up. However, yeah. So Caesar and Mike are in the van with us. It's gonna, it's Fahrenheit's gonna be playing. And they both drop acid. And I'm like, uh, you know, at the time, I really, I was barely smoking weed. I definitely wasn't fucking with acid. Yeah. They're just, they're, they're being wild boys in the van. You know, you don't want to be, I, I've, I've taken acid in the van rides. You don't want to be in a confined space when you're tripping. Uh -huh. It's just, it's bad fucking. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. So Caesar is like, I can't feel nothing, and he's punching himself in the face. Mike's punching him in the face. <laughs> and so, you don't feel nothing, huh? He's like, yeah. I was like, let me see your hand. And he's like, all right. So he sticks his fucking thumb. I was like, oh, let me no. see your thumb. He's like, yeah. So I pull out my lighter, and I just, I just start, for like 
for like a good like I don't know thirty seconds a minute, and I don't feel nothing. Well, later that day, we popped a blister on him that was like the size of like a stack of nickels. Oh no! And, and, and it's actually there was a video of this whole incident that has it was an infamous video. Like someone recorded the whole weekend. This tape has long since disappeared. That's too bad. That's I don't know insane. who has it. It got passed around the band. I'm sure somebody has it or it's been recorded over a loss. Yeah. But it was one of those. It, the whole van ride up was recorded. The show was recorded. The aftermath was recorded. The hotel rooms were recorded. Just And it was just chaos the entire time. Between, you know, everyone being drunk and high imbeciles to my, the Mike and Caesar show. And it was a show. Like, they would break into people's rooms, throw water at people, oh you know, just... God. It was chaos. The whole fucking weekend was just chaos. Caesar's walking around with a fucking rag on his finger. You know, he looked, he looked like he had a novelty thumb hitchhiking. <laughs> you know. Wow. But, that, I mean, that's the thing. Is we, we all took it... We would take the parting thing a little too far. I mean, but that's what we did, you know. It's yeah. like, none of us were innocent. Yeah, Nobody sure. was ever innocent, you know. I think, like I said, we all just got along because we're all fucking weird ass street kid fuck up musicians, and we all just ended up together because that's our lot in life, yep. you know. We make do with what we have, and these are the people we have, you know. And like I said, District Nine was our brother band yeah. during this whole time, and you know, when I was in District, you know, I was in District Nine, I was doing other things and then you want to talk about another band that was another band I was in with some Bronx people called Dominican Day Parade okay sure yeah this was a very very short lived band um so it was me and Armando from Fahrenheit he was singing I'm playing guitar uh Pete LaRussa who normally is a drummer played bass and then we got Gigi Cano oh sure 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 Gigi is a very very talented musician she played with ADD she played with Johnny Cage as a fake. She's uh -huh. played with Step Too Far. She's a Bronx native as well. Yeah. Um, extremely talented drummer and percussionist. She's currently living in Spain. She's been living there now, what, about 10 years? More than that, it feels like. Yeah, maybe 15. Yeah. So, you know, we want, me and Amanda wanted to have a fun band. Our real goal was just to play the Manitoba's Bar. Okay. Because yeah, there was yeah. a little scene that had developed out of Manitoba's for a while there where they were allowing bands to play in the bar. And I had seen a couple shows there and I was like, this is fucking great. Yeah. You know, I was like, this is like everyone's hanging out, they're drinking, we're having a good old time. And me and Armando like, let's get a band together, you know. And we, you know, at that time, Fahrenheit had been broken up for a, a while. You know, but me and Armando didn't talk during that time because there was a fall. There was a falling out between a few of the members. Okay. But we had to start talking, and we're like, "It's our band." So we're like, and we we're just bullshitting. Like, who can we get to play drums? They're like, you know, Armando was like, "Let's get Gigi." I was like, "We we knew Gigi. Gigi yeah. was another one of the characters in the scene yeah, sure. from that time. She was around. Same thing with Chucky. Chucky was another character. He was always around. There's a lot of people like that. There was people who have since disappeared, you know, and... But I'm she was one of the best human beings we, as a character. Yeah, but Gigi has a good soul, <laughs> you know, she but, G G G you know, yeah. so we, we actually, I think we walked to her job. She was working as a receptionist at a tattoo, tattoo shop. She was already playing, like, two or three bands. Proof of Purchase, maybe, at that time. Yeah, it might have been yeah, Proof of Purchase. Yeah. But she, I think she was, at that time, she was playing in ADD... Johnny Cage had stepped too far. Oh, I see, I see, I see. Wow. So she, so she was playing with those three bands. Proof of Purchase was definitely before Early. that. Yeah, that's right, that's right. Um, so anyway, we walked down. Hey, Gigi, you want to be in another band? You know, we're always thinking she's gonna say no. It's like, it's like, yeah, sure. We're a band. We played, I think, twelve shows and broke up. And that was our purpose. We were they literally put the band together to play twelve to play. shows. Yeah, yeah. We sure. just wanted to play Manitobas. Yep. And drink for free. Yeah. And that's what we did. And you succeeded in that, huh? Yeah. <laughs> the, the songs have finally made it up on Spotify, so if anyone yeah. wants to check that crap out, it's, it's... You know, that band was all about, let's do as much bad shit to ourselves as we can <laughs> and see if we can pull it off. <laughs> you know, and, and the hilarity is not... I mean, it's just more of about abuse 
you know, like there was a one show in particular where I went. Gigi used to live at the rehearsal studio down in Manhattan. Yeah. Where she, you know, where she, well, well, I don't know what the fuck she was doing there, but she was essentially squatting in a studio. And that's where we used to rehearse. And one day, we had a show down at one six nine bar. Start fucking. We started day drinking and smoking weed. And this is like at four o'clock in the afternoon. We got picked up at like eight o'clock for the show. We were fucking already done. And then you add more bullshit to the mix. You know, it was just, you know, again, it was like, can we do this? Well, we're going to find out. <laughs> and that was like the whole purpose of DDP was like, it was like, all right, let's, uh, let's turn the dial up on the fucking abuse and see what happens. And it was just more about me and Armando just talking shit to each other with, with Gigi talking shit from the back and Pete interjecting here and there and just, you know, it was a fun band. It's like, it's a band that like the people who were there know about it and will talk about it for days. The people that weren't there go, I don't get it. Yeah. Yeah. You sure, know? sure. But yeah, Gigi was like one of those characters, just, you know, fantastic drummer, heart of gold. She's definitely a player was always around during those, that time, you know, and then like, Another guy, Chucky Brown. Chucky Brown, I met Chucky Brown probably in 92 or 93. And he was always a quiet, skinny, fucking Spanish kid who hung out in the corner and videotaped everything. Yeah, yeah. And you would never, like, you wouldn't know, know he was there half the time. Because he was just, he would blend into the wall. And it wasn't until years later when I started noticing, like, he's starting to put up all these old shows from back in the day. And I'm like, and one day... I was like, just bullshit. I was like, hey, do you, do you, I have a bunch of Fahrenheit like VHSs. Do you want to put them on your channel? Yeah. And he's like, yeah, I'll make you uh, DVD copies for them, which he did. He still has my videotapes, and that's been fucking six years ago. <laughs> but they're not going anywhere. Yeah, sure, sure, sure. And to be honest with you, where am I going to put them? <laughs> so in the while well, I was, well, you know, I said, all right, let me go. I'll meet up with you. So drove up to his place, and I was like. Start bullshitting. What do you want to do for a band? You know, like, what are you doing musically? He's like, oh, oh yeah. So, uh, Chucky. So, yeah, we, when I gave him the videos, I was like, hey, do you want to, uh, do you want to start a band? You know, because at the time I had nothing going on. Yeah. He had nothing going on. He had just, I think, Abject had maybe just broken up or were broken up for a year or two. So he's like, I was like, all right, fine. You know, and then we dicked around for like, a couple months trying to find other players. Uh, drummer Jason is a neighbor of mine. I knew him when he when he played in Download. He still plays in Download when they play. And then looking for a bass player, Kevin said he was available to do it. And I was like, all right, fuck it. We've been a band since, and that's just 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 the play to play. We don't really give a fuck. Yeah, you know, yeah, it's sure. like I'm not, I'm not here to impress anybody. The goal was to write quick, fast, hardcore songs in the vein of, like, old-school shit, and that's yeah. kind of what we set out to do. There's really no limit on what we want to do, how much we want to play, how little we want to play. Just have fun and fucking play, you yeah. know? Shut up and get your guitar, you know? Absolutely. You know, don't fuck around, just do it. Um, so as far as, uh, well, all the different bands you've been in, what are some of the, like, shows that stand out the most in your mind? Uh, hmm... I could I could probably name a show per band that okay yeah that's that, good. that's that good. could probably be like I think without a cause any show we played at Bond Street a lot of them were really good but there's one show in particular that I seem to remember Fort Hamilton High School in 1992 towards the fall um, it was just high school auditorium it was yeah. essentially high school gig but it was the wildest, like, there had to be, like, three or 400 kids in this auditorium. And watching a bunch of 15-year-olds, like, like, they don't know what slam dancing is, but they do and they don't. It just, like, it was like watching a bunch of, like, watching a bunch of, like, young teenagers beat the shit out of each other. And not understanding that you're not really supposed to purposely hit your fellow member. Yeah. You know? Um, Fahrenheit... There's been so many wild moments with Fahrenheit. Um, I would say playing 
at Irving Plaza with VOD for a sold out show with us in direct support. Yeah. Because both those bands sort of came up around the same time, give or take a year. But, you know, we had known those. Uh, without a call, had played had played some shows with VOD, you know, d- during the Bond Street era, I believe. And we had seen them around and whatnot. And by the time that, like, they had their first record on Roadrunner out, we did a, like, a quick, like, week jaunt down yeah. the East Coast and back. The second show of the tour was Irving Plaza. And, like, a month before the show, we, had, like, we're, like, keep getting little reports about the ticket sales because we're all kind of curious. It's like, you know, it's our first time really, like, headlining a, a show of that magnitude. Yeah, sure. And we kept hearing, uh, all right, they're at 600. And we had played Irving Plaza once before, but yeah. it wasn't a packed show. So we're like, all right. 600 or sold, or half the venue. And, it, you know, and like a couple days before the show, we heard, sold out. Between, I think between selling it out and the people we snuck in, there was easily 1,200 people in Irving Plaza. So it's one way to like really just, like, your home. Yeah. You know, you're, you're, it's like playing the garden for us. Yeah, I mean, and any tramp show we played with H2O, both of those tramp shows we did with H2O were just amazing. They were just, that, yeah. again, right place, right time, right bands, just hundreds upon hundreds of kids just going ape shit. Um, District Nine is I don't know about I would say shows because there were a lot of cool shows. I think there were just so many fun, random moments with those guys. You know, there was so many, there's a, I mean, that band never really played a bad show. I mean, none of these bands ever really, I mean, Fahrenheit, a, a bad Fahrenheit show was someone maybe breaking a guitar string. Okay, yeah, yeah, we yeah were, sure. The band was usually always tight. District 9 was mostly always tight. But with District 9, I would say it's the moments I had with those guys hanging out and being in the same space because Mike's fucking hysterical. You get him going, and he's got jokes for days. Caesar, the same thing. You know, me and Caesar could get together and just start bullshitting, and everyone else is laughing. <laughs> you know, and, and you're just like, I'm in the middle of the storm of fucking nonsense. <laughs> uh, DDP, definitely 169 bar. Yeah. Um, because it was probably the drunkest I've ever been on stage, and it's <laughs> on YouTube. <laughs> It's a, it's a little embarrassing to watch because it's just I'm just there half the time laughing at myself. <laughs> Crazy mm-hmm. Eddie's just, you know, we just have fun. Yeah, sure, sure. We just have fun. It's it's you know it's, it's you know a lot of the shows we've played down when the Niagara was doing shows. And now it's Barry Electric, the uh, hardcore matinees. Those are all been really fun shows to play. You know, people tend it's a little bit more of a sense of community. You know, than I've seen in a while, and, and that's really it. I mean, there's, I mean, I've been in so many fucking bands. I've been in so many other bands yeah, with sure, other sure. people, and and jam, but you know, got to jam with some you know people I've looked up with, you know, but never formed a band with them. Just like jamming for the sake of jamming, you know. And I've had a lot of those moments where it's just like, hey, what are you doing today? Want to jam? All right, let's go. Let's, let's go play, you know. And that's really it. Just. You know, it, there's so many great memories. I mean, I figured it out like a year or so ago how many shows I've played to date, and it's over a thousand. Wow. So, you know, I occasionally will get like tagged in a flyer for something. Yeah. And it's something I know I played, and sometimes that'll trigger a memory. Just looking at the, the, the city, the town. The date it was on, the lineup, and I go, oh, shit. And I'll have a vivid memory of it. And there's other times I'll look at it and go, I know I played the show. I can't tell you nothing about it. Yep. You know, because sometimes it's just, especially when you're on tour for two or three or four weeks, after a while, the, it's like Groundhog's Day. Yeah, sure. You know, you're in the van six to eight hours a day, and you're just like, oh, my God. God, we've got to load in in fucking two hours, and there's nothing to do in this town, and what the fuck, thank you God for weed, to keep kill the time in my brain cells, because, you know, and that's, 
That's what we would do half the day, yeah. especially in Fahrenheit. There was nothing to do all day, so yeah. you know, we just fucking smoke weed. You know, it helps keep kill the time. Because if not, you're just sitting there like, you know, a lot of times you roll up to a town or a city, and there's literally nothing to do. You know, or you roll into a town or city and you don't want to go see it. Yeah, like for sure. Like, you know, you roll up to Detroit in 97 and you go, yeah, I'm not fucking going anywhere. Yeah, yeah. You know, yeah, this yeah, is, yeah. you go a block over, you're getting shot. Yeah. Same thing with, I mean, just, again, smoke weed to fucking pass the time away. Because, you know, trying to read with these maniacs and <laughs> forget it. <laughs> you know. What, what's the furthest away you played from New York? Uh, for a show. For a show? California. California. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, we never, I never was able to, we never got to Europe, unfortunately. Yeah. Uh the time we got to, the time we got to Japan, like we were talking about Japan, the economy fell out on them in the in the late nineties, so that fell to shit. Yeah. yeah. Uh, Europe, we could have went to Europe a couple times, but it would have cost us out of our own pocket. Oh. You know, a lot a lot of times bands go to Europe, and unfortunately, you have to up front a lot of the money. Damn. Um, unless you're going with like a reputable like booking agent who will pay for everything up front or lay out at least most of it you know i've known a lot of bands have gone to europe and here's the fucked up thing about youtube being a thing oh we had a great tour and now those tours are now in length on youtube and i'm like you had a great tour huh <laughs> now you can check <laughs> now i can check and, and the thing is i remember those stories of people like we had a great tour blah blah blah, blah. Like, it's like dude like seven of your shows are up there you had one really good show and then you played for five people and yep. came home with no money yep and that was the thing with us we, we tried to always you, with bands you try to be self-sufficient yes yeah, sure. you know it's like you do it for the love but at the same time you're hoping that someone you're hoping to get paid at some point Absolutely. You know, I, I, nowadays I don't give a fuck. I have a job to get paid. Yeah. You know, and I don't care about playing for money nowadays. It's playing for myself. It's to play to enjoy, play to express. Um, I think back then, with, especially with a band like Fahrenheit, we were on that precipice a few times to be on a major label or on a fairly big, um, you know, independent. And we always thought, I guess... Our crew, our manager, and everybody else that was behind us always thought we could... Like, it was never the right thing for us. We always yeah. were just... It's like, ah, that's good, but I think we can do better over here. I think we got to talk to these people. And then it just... It just... The band fell apart. Last yeah, sure. few months of the band, you know, got... Certain guys weren't getting along anymore, and it just turned into problematic. But that's... That's band shit, you know? It's, that that's happens. a band. Yeah. yeah. You know? just sucks it is what it is but you know we're back together and we're enjoying our each other's company for the most part and we're writing stuff and you know we're just we're here to play it when we can about to release what two more songs is that yeah we wrote two brand new songs and, and they're not released yet though right i'll let you hear it okay and we get off to here okay um <laughs> it's it's on a shitty cell phone speaker yeah yeah, yeah. But, sure 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 but yeah we um yeah we're just you know what it was? At this point, we can easily do the, you know, you can easily come back and do the greatest hits thing over and over and over again. And some bands do that. And I know friends of mine who do that, and they're fine with it. Yeah. Um, I think with us, we wanted to give ourselves sort of like, well, we got this band together. We got Lou playing drums, and Lou brings a different element of, of playing into the band. Lou comes from more of you know, rhythm and groove where Ray was more technical and yeah. and whatnot and he's brought certain aspects out of the band that we've never seen you know, we never had before. Um and we were just like, okay, let's uh let's try to write a couple songs, see what happens and we, we did. You know, we had a friend of ours record it for us and you know, and, and like I said, by the time this is out, this should be out within the next week or two, which whatever. Um, and yeah, it's interesting. Cause Four in the Chamber put out some new stuff. Yeah, this last year too. And I don't, I don't know. Uh, they, 
there's a that's something I'll talk to you off camera. Yeah, sure, <laughs> Dave, sure, sure, I, sure. I I love Dave and I've known Dave for a long time. I was in Dave's uh, first wedding, which is another story I can't tell on camera. Um, <laughs> just a lot of bad shit went down at his wedding. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And I got to trouble. <laughs> Dave, Dave knows exactly what I mean. He's going to see this and go, oh, I remember that day. <laughs> That's why I'm not with her anymore. Um, but, yeah, no, I've known Dave forever. I was in his first wedding. I still, we still chatted up time to time. In fact, you know, I BSed with him a little before, uh, a week ago before I came here just to, like, get some of my facts straight. I'm like, it's like, when did you join the band again? <laughs> I sort of remember, but did you yeah, come sure. first or did Ray come first? Sure. And, you know, and. You know, like I said, we're all, we all have known, at this point, like, all the Bronx guys and all the guys who played in Bronx bands, we're all, we all know each other, you yeah. know, it's, a, it's, we're all like, I think we're all more amazed that we're all still here. Yeah, sure. You know, I'm always excited to see new stuff come out of the Bronx. Yeah. But I'm also, you know, it also sort of sucks when, you know, you want to support new bands and they don't really give a fuck if you support them or not it's just like like, dude it's like i'm trying to pass you the torch here yeah you know yeah Uh, you know it's like there's nothing wrong with fucking old people look watching music you know i'm not i'm not trying to jump in the pit (laughs) you put in your time (laughs) yeah i put in my time i've i've i I earned my fucking scene points and then some man it's just like i don't need to prove myself to anybody i've been doing this for 32 years and, you know, I enjoy it still. Yeah. I, I love the music. I love the community for the most part. Um, like I said, there's some people are very, there's definitely younger kids who want to know and hear things. There's other ones that wish to us older guys would roll over and fucking die. But yep. that that's, that's to be expected, you know. I mean, you know, kill the old, you know, I'll put the new. And, I, you know, I get it. Yeah, sure. I get it, you know. It's like... Just bring your A game, Junior. <laughs> so, so speaking of uh, younger generations, uh, I, I'm, I'm sure you've been asked this question before. But what uh, uh, what advice or or what do you have to give to people just entering the scene or who've recently entered the scene? Uh, honestly, if if you're looking to make a living out of this, be prepared to work. Um, be prepared to work a lot. There's a lot of bands out there that are road dog bands and they play all the time, they're touring all the time, and they're still not coming home with a lot of money. Um, there's other bands, when I hear this one a lot actually, uh, I want to make the band my life. And the first thing I usually say, then what the fuck are you doing home talking to me? <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. It's like, what do you mean? What's today? Oh, it's Wednesday. Should be on the road somewhere playing. Well, I then don't talk to me about the band being your life. You have to fucking. You, when I was playing, the band came before everything. It came came before family. It came before girlfriends. It came before anything. That was the life. We rehearsed fucking two to three times a fucking week when we weren't playing. You know we could play with our eyes closed, play with the lights off, you know, we could play under the influence of fucking substances, yeah. you know, we were just that crazy fucking type, type of band, not saying that that's, you know, there's bands that are loose that are fucking phenomenal, Sure. but we were just masters at our craft, and I think with younger bands, when I hear, I want to make this band my life, then fucking give it all up and go on the road and live it. And you're going to find out really fucking quickly it's a lot of downtime, a lot of hurry up and wait for 30 minutes of play uh-huh. and very little monetary reward. But there's been plenty of bands out there that have been on the road for 10 years and are now playing with bands such as Blink-182. Yep. You know, Turnstile seems to be doing very well for themselves right now. Absolutely. And they gave up a lot to be that band. Yeah. Those guys live in a band house. Those guys fucking live together, sleep together, fucking are away all the time. 
You wanted, you know, and that's no guarantee. That could have went the other way on them. Could have been, yeah. You know, there's a band that I played with a, a, a few years ago that are still nice guys. They're on the road probably a good portion of the, at least 150 days. And I don't think they make any money, but it's, they get, make enough money to put some food in the belly. And off to the next adventure, I think it's about the adventure, because why the fuck be at home? If, you know, if you can live on the cheap, and they're, they're from down south, so, you know, they just, you know, if you put enough gas in the vehicle, and some food in your belly, and get a gig the next day and do the same adventure all over again, have fun. If that's what you're about, be about it. Uh, you want to be signed to a record label? Don't do it. You don't need them anymore. Yep. You know, there's too many fucking 360 deals going on. There's too much ownership of your stuff. Uh, own your stuff. Own your masters. Own your music. Uh, be your own boss. You know, you don't need label. I mean, labels help. If you want to be a Taylor Swift, yeah, you're going to have to eat some shit. And yeah, you know, there's a reason why Taylor Swift, you know, is able to control her destiny now. You know, she worked at it, you yep. know, regardless of whether you love her, hate her, whatever, she has control of her own path right now. Yeah. yeah All right, maybe yeah. she did some dubious shit in the past. But guess what? She, you know, perseverance, you know, because a lot of people that fucking tried to do the same stuff and went nowhere. Yep. Be, you know, just persevere, you know, just, you know, whatever you think is successful to, you know, to your point. You know, if you wanted to sell out a club and you finally got to that point, you're success. You're successful. You know, I mean, I consider myself maintaining. I I don't again don't do it for any particular reason. Probably because I don't know any better. Yeah, sure. Uh, you know, I just I've been playing I've been playing music, fucking more than. Almost, fuck man. Forty, nah, forty, like thirty-eight years of my life. I've played some sort of instrument, and I don't know any better. And if I didn't have this, I'd probably be playing at home, fucking around, doing whatever. But it's a lot more fun to play with people, and very loud, and just, you know, sweating. You know, that, that, there's, it's, you know, I tell people, being on stage is better than drugs, it's better than sex, it's better than anything, it's, you know, don't really give a fuck if it's in front of five or five thousand. You know, it's to me, it's the same shit. Yeah. You know, I get the same rush. And I get the. It's not even just that. It's the routine for me. It's it's getting to the show, storing the gear, fucking stretching the butterfly, the little butterflies beforehand, setting up, fucking watch. You know, you know this fucking a bunch of eyes watching your every move as you set up, and you're just like, oh god. <laughs> You know, but you love it. Yeah. You love it. Like I said, play because you want to play. If you happen to get famous for it and, you know, just have a good lawyer. <laughs> have That's a good right. lawyer because you will get fucked. That's right. That's right. Um, so uh, th this next question, uh, it, it might be a simple no answer or it could be, it could be you know, a much Throw it at answer. me. Is there such a thing as a Bronx hardcore sound? And if so... What do you think that is? Ooh, that's a good one. Um, see, I've played in. See, this, this, you you got me on this one because because <laughs> yeah. see, there could some people could say no. I think there is, and you know, not to sound like an egotistical dick. <laughs> But I think I played in two of the Bronx sounding hardcore bands. Yeah, sure. To, you know, what I think epitomizes Bronx hardcore is the fact that you had someone like Armando or Mike bringing in that crossover of the fucking hip hop vibe and the flow into the lyrics. You know, Mike definitely had a little more hardcore in him. And Mondo did too, to a certain degree. But they infused fucking that hip-hop swagger and brought that in because, you know, they did it genuine. Yeah, to sure. me, you could be a metal band and metal bands could come from anywhere, but I've seen plenty of fucking guys try to hip-hop swagger shit from that come from New Jersey, 
And not taking anything away from fucking New Jersey, but fuck you, Sugar Hill Gang. You ain't the Bronx. I just really feel like, you know, those, you know, again, two different singers completely. Absolutely. And they, they also have known each other. You know, again, those guys have been friends since they were fucking teenagers. You know, so they have their own connection within themselves. But those two guys brought a bit of swag and a bit of fucking attitude into the Bronx sound. Yeah. You know, they brought a certain thing, you know, where they brought that funkiness into play that, you know, you don't see in a straight metal band. Yeah, sure. You know? There are metal bands that do have the funkiness. One of those bands being, let's say, Candiria. Sure, sure, You know, sure. Candiria, totally different fucking ball game with Candiria. You could, I could say it for hours and talk about fucking how crazy Candiria is, but we're not going to. Um, I like I said, I think they definitely brought in that aspect of, you know, openness to sounds like you couldn't find. You know, you can easily say, oh well, you know, you could find that you know, with bands now, but it's a little easier now. Yeah, sure. Especially when you've had, you know, fucking a band like Limp Bizkit come in with the corniness of fucking Fred Durst with his rapping bullshit. You know, sorry, brother. You're from fucking Florida. Go fuck yourself. <laughs> you can take fucking Vanilla Ice and go fucking suck a dick. Um, and the Vanilla Ice I heard, by the way, is a nice guy. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. I've heard of Vanilla Ice is a nice guy. No disrespect to you, Vanilla, but, you know, let's get real. Um, but yeah, I, like I said, I think those guys epitomize that thing of the Bronx sound if you wanted to go there. You know, and that's not taking away anything from any of the bands that have come after those bands or before those bands. Sure. You know, but I think that those two guys brought something out of, you know, their influences of, you know, loving hip hop, also loving fucking Latin music in general. There's a bit of swag there, you know. Yeah. Then there's also fucking the bilingual thing that the occasion gets thrown into it. Uh -huh. You know, you throw that in there and it adds into the fucking stew that is that flavor of the Bronx. The Bronx is not white, it's not black, it's not Puerto Rican, it is fucking, it, you know, it is a melting pot of cultures and different fucking, and different visions that people have, you know, I mean, I mean, yeah, Queens, don't get me wrong, I've lived in Queens now for fucking like 16, 17 years, and they say Queens is a melting pot, yeah, it is, you know, but it, people tend to sort of stick with their own here, you can still find plenty of fucking white people living in with black people, living in with Puerto Ricans, living in uh -huh. with Dominicans, and then you throw the island, people from the islands in here too, and it all mixes into one stew up here, and you know, it's shoulder to shoulder living. It's it's gonna have an effect on you. Yeah. You have to get along. Yeah. You have to get along with people up here. The borough is not as you know, the borough is not as widespread as you think it is, you know. Everyone fucking has to come together. Whether you like it or not, you got to fucking travel from one neighborhood to get to another. Yep. And you're going to encounter people. It's up to you to how you want to fucking decide if you want to get along with that person or not. If you have a closed mind, that's on you. Yep. You know, that's on you. Fucking that ain't on me. You know, don't get me wrong. Shit happens. It's New York, baby. You know, <laughs> it's New York. <laughs> Shit can pop off at any fucking moment, but, you know, it's luck of the draw sometimes. Sometimes is, you eat yeah. the bear, sometimes the bear eats you. And, you know, sometimes you're just lucky. But, yeah, I think there's definitely a Bronx sound, and I think that those two guys epitomize the Bronx sound, for sure. Definitely Mike and Armando. I think that they both brought something to the table that I haven't really seen done right since, yep. you know? Yep. It's like... And again, that's not taking anything away from anybody. And I know that I know a bunch of dudes in these other bands. You know, they're friends of mine, and I'm not. You know, I'm not trying to say, "Oh, well, look what we did." No, it doesn't matter what we fucking do. We we've been there, we've done it. Who gives a fuck? You know, that and a fucking nickel won't get you on the subway. So, yep. take it for what it is. 
Well, the, the final question I have for you is, when is the mandolin coming to Fahrenheit 451? <laughs> don't tempt it, man. There's already enough wacky shit in our fucking music. We don't need no more fucking... Your you first know. instrument, you gotta bring it in. I don't even have it anymore. I don't have that mandolin. That thing's been long since gone. You know? When is oboe coming in? No, don't, don't front. I played that. Oh, shut up. <laughs> oboe. But it was a pleasure. I, hey, thank I appreciate you so much. It. Really appreciate you taking so much time. Yeah, yeah.